Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of the committee in 2014. Everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members uh, may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, if we could move on to uh, agenda item one, uh, and that is to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item two today is an oral evidence session on our inquiry into local government funding and welfare reform. We have uh, one panel and one round table session this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome the first panel, uh, and we have Sue Bruce, Chief Executive of City of Edinburgh Council, Elma Murray, Chief Executive of North Ayrshire Council, uh, Dawson Lamont, Head of Exchequer and Revenues of Highland Council, and Sandra Black, Director of Finance and Corporate Services at Renfrewshire Council. Uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, would you like to make any opening remarks at all? Opening Ms. remarks, Murray. Chair, if that would be okay. Certainly. Um, just, just really picking a couple of relevant points from the Council's submission to the Committee and on the issue of welfare reform, and particularly, I guess, some of the um, issues that the Council has been experiencing. Just maybe touch on discretionary housing payments, which I'm sure Committee will be interested in, um, which we have seen increase from 500 a year. Um, to 4,500 a year um, in 2013 from what we had um, the previous year. Um, also, I wanted to, to raise committee's attention to um, the increased support and uh, guidance that has been given to council tenants um, over the, the last year, which has now increased to over 5,000 visits, and that's, that's made by our housing services staff. But that um, has a, a positive impact in terms of the relationship that we have with our tenants, which is in, improving as well because of the amount of day-to-day -day contact that we're having with them. Um, <clears throat> to do that, we did put in place a dedicated welfare a reform team and a committee may want to, to, to look at that uh, a bit later on as well. Um, the other point that I wanted to raise was about homelessness. And um, we have seen an increase in homelessness over, over the last year of about 10%. But particularly our homelessness assessment, prevention and advice service, which is very much about preventing homelessness, we've seen um, a big increase in households approaching us about financial issues and also about issues on under-occupation. The last couple of points that I wanted to make to, to committee were around social services. And um, we have seen a big increase, unsurprisingly, in relation to welfare rights inquiries, but also, unfortunately, a big increase in destitution presentations, which we have um, been managing very carefully over the last year. And on a, a positive note, um, because of the push towards digital by default, um, our library computer bookings have increased by around 15% over the last year, the biggest uptake that we've had since 2007 So again, that's something that we're actually quite pleased to see, but not necessarily um, the, the, the background for, for uh, people coming forward in that way. Okay. Does Mrs Bruce. Uh, thank you. Yes, just similar um, comments to those that Elma has made. And I think one of the things that is noteworthy is probably um, recognising Edinburgh, as with other councils, is the partnership working across agencies um, who can work together to try and um, assist individuals who are finding challenges through um, the changes to welfare reform. Something which um, we were concerned about in Edinburgh was that our crisis grant allocation um, at the end of the last full financial year was just slightly higher than the Scottish average, as was 73.2%. Um, we had um, a significantly um, larger amount of rent arrears as well to that that we'd previously um, experienced, but um, due to a wide-ranging um, homelessness prevention um, exercise in conjunction with partners had managed to try and keep homeless um, presentations in a downward trend, notwithstanding if you, if you just go out and have a look, there appear to be more people presenting with elements of destitution just um, on the streets of Edinburgh, and that's something that we're addressing with um, other partners. So the strategy in the round is, is targeted at the prevention of hardship and, and worsening inequality. Um, we're looking at effective responses to crisis need for housing, heat and food, um, and looking at effective support for vulnerable individuals and families. 
Um, and I think one of the things that's come through from our social services colleagues is concern about a higher number of presentations of mental health issues. And I think in the wider context of pressure on health and social care resources, that's something that we are concerned about. Um, and if you look at that kind of pressure, coupled with the pressure that we're seeing in other policy areas, such as unscheduled care presentations, then that really is beginning to create a bit of a budget bottleneck. Thank you very much for, for that. Is there anything you wish to add before we... Mr Lamont? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I basically agree with the, the, the comments, or, or, or I would have similar comments to, to, <coughs> to colleagues on my left. Um, the, the position of Highland, though, is probably a little unique in this, in that we are the only Scottish Council, as, as members know, that um, is implementing uh, universal credit at the moment. Now, because of that, you would expect us to, to, to know all the ins and outs of it. But the one caveat that I would sound is that um, the implementation has been so slow. You know, the volumes that we're dealing with so far are so slow that really it's, it's difficult to, um, to draw any firm conclusions in regard to the in regard to the longer term. It's only when the scope and complexity <coughs> of the cases that are being dealt with increase. And, and of course, we know that in June, couples are going to be brought into the net and then families later in the year. It's only really when, when these start to bite that we will have firm evidence uh, on, on which to, 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 to base what, what the requirements will be. We do have corporate measures in place covering issues like homelessness. Money advice has been a big issue. But the concern of my council is really in relation to the cumulative effect of all of these measures on the local economy, rather than universal credit, which of course is just one strand uh, of, of, of the whole thing. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, if, I, if I could start off um, very, very briefly in terms of um, the uh, areas uh, of social care uh, where we've got very little evidence as yet, but a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, round about the impacts uh, that welfare reform is causing in these areas. Um, Ms Murray talked about more uh, people uh, coming forward destitute, uh, a rise in homelessness. Um, do your councils uh, have... Uh, any way of actually analysing uh, the impacts of welfare reform on these other budgets, um, which you know are not um, uh, uh, seen as being directly affected. Mrs. Bruce mentioned mental health. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to track these things. Are you going to analyse these things as you move towards the budgetary period? to ensure um, that the right amount of monies are in place to deal with these matters. Can we start with Mrs Bruce, please? Yes, uh, convener, that is something that we're looking at, trying to understand the correlation between demands on services. And I think that um, kind of emphasises the need for us to work, work collegiately with, with other agencies. And we've got colleagues here from Citizens Advice and other similar agencies who um, would help to provide the rounded picture, but certainly as we go forward in our budget preparations within the Council for the next round of decisions later on this year, we're trying to um, understand in more detail the links between um, demands on services such as mental health and the pressures that we're seeing. And I think um, one of the things that we've noticed, and it's coming back to the particularly the housing thing, in... in um, publicly rented houses that are run by the council, we've noticed um, a 44% um, number of those with under-occupancy having uh, rental arrears, and that is a substantial ri rise in the previous trends that we've been seeing in Edinburgh. And that is bringing with it the worries and the strains to families who are dealing with the pressures of these things. And we're seeing that read across. So we are going to be doing more detailed work with colleagues in social services and with the NHS to make sure that we understand where the common trends are. And obviously those um, arrears, um, some of which will be uh, dealt with by the mitigation measures that the 
the Scottish yeah. Government are putting in place around about increasing DHP. But those arrears um, have an effect on, on all tenants in terms of the fact that you'll be unable to invest in the housing stock. Is that correct? That, that's right. And we've, uh, we've actually um, recently, the last series of policy and strategy committees, had deputations from the um, Lothian Anti-Bedroom Tax Federation. And what they're bringing to us are cases of individuals who they're saying are, are not necessarily managing to cope with the demands that are on them as individuals and are having to find people who can advocate for them. So one of the concerns is that um, individuals who don't make themselves known mm -hmm. to public services or to groups that can assist um, are at risk of, um, if you like, subsuming the pressures upon themselves. So we need to be careful about that. The, um, the crisis grant payments have been um, high, and I think that's something that I mentioned in the in the opener, that the crisis grants payments in Edinburgh have been slightly ahead of the national average. So we'll have to keep an eye on, obviously, being able to fund that, but also understanding what the, the drivers for those um, numbers are. Ms Murray, a similar picture, and would it be fair to say that the UK government's welfare reforms are impacting not only on those folks who are reliant on some benefit payments, but others too, um, including council house tenants um, and, and the less money that there is to, to deal with capital budgets? Yes, ab ab absolutely, Chair. Um, we are seeing um, changes in the way in which um, our uh, properties, our stock, our housing stock is being let and uh, a clear increase in the difficulty in letting um, stock, which where we have three bedrooms, for example, um, and that's a piece of work that we're undertaking just now. Um, we, we also, um, I think it's fair to say that um, it's impacting on, on people that are not always just benefit claimants, but perhaps people who are uh, in lower paid jobs um, and who are um, <coughs> not quite reaching the, the threshold levels to be able to claim benefits. They're finding it quite difficult as well. Um, another aspect that the committee, I think, is probably... Uh, would, is likely to be interested in would be um, how food banks are working locally as well. So we've had very significant increases in vouchers that are being provided uh, for uh, people to make use of, of food banks as well. And um, while I don't have any um, uh, absolute uh, numbers for you today, we have um, had reports of people who, um, while they might be getting support from food banks, are uh, struggling to then afford the, the energy to, to cook food um, and, in some cases, returning it. So that's, that's proving to be difficult um, locally as well. Can, can I mention one other area that when, sure. you, when you talked about social services? And one of the other areas that I'm mindful of is um, in relation to child protection. Um, and what, what we've seen um, over the years of the recession has been um, uh, an increase in child protection referrals, and that is not particularly alleviating at the moment. And um, without, uh, no, again, not having um, hard evidence on this at the moment, but we're starting to collect it, we, we, we believe that there are um, consequences um, from uh, some of the hardships that people are facing through welfare reform and child protection as well, particularly in cases um, of neglect. Thank you. Uh, Mr Lamont, have you got anything to add? Obviously, you have the universal credit pilot, as you've already mentioned. Um, is that adding to the woes in terms of, of, of rent arrears in Highland? Um, I, th I think, Chairman, it's probably too early to, to make that as a, as, as a material point. Um, I mean, I, 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 for example, have looked at the, the food bank uptake in, 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 in the Highlands. Now, go going back to uh, 2012, uh, there were 3,458 adults and 1,035 children being fed by food banks. In, in, the, in, the, in the year ended 31st March 14, uh, the figures were 4,025, including 1,094 children. Um, so that's an increase of 14% for reasons presumably other than universal credit. On the point of uh, council tax rent arrears, uh, we have been fortunate in Highland <coughs> in that our own HRA tenants uh, have largely been protected by, by the payment of discretionary housing payments. However, 
um, that's to, to, to ignore those other social tenants where there is probably scope for further payments being made. So these measures, such as discretionary housing payments, are, are very welcome. Uh, they're certainly not a long-term solution to the issue, um, but uh, th they, they have had a beneficial effect on the, on the Council's own stock. And we're continuing to work and work with other agencies, and we're in close contact with uh, other social landlords, indeed landlords generally, um, to, to indicate what assistance can be made available for, particularly for vulnerable people. The, the Renfrewshire experience, please. Um, yes, in Renfrewshire we are experiencing um, similar symptoms to, to, to the other councils as, as described. Um, I, I think that one of our major concerns is that we, we are dealing at the moment with a lot of the, the short-term impacts and, and um, obviously uh, spending a lot of resource and time um, dealing with those. And I'm able to uh, quote some of the statistics from our Renfrewshire uh, perspective, but we do see some of those um, as symptoms of a, a much um, bigger, longer-term problem uh, for the citizens of, of Renfrewshire, um, which we think will um, bring with it significant cost pressures uh, for, for the future. We're, we're aware that there's a, for example, um, because of welfare changes and um, other employment issues in the area, we are aware of a 20% forecast increase in child poverty. Um, across Scotland and um, we as a council we're, we're very concerned about that. Um, we, we've established a, a poverty commission in the Renfrewshire area working with a, a range of community planning partners. We have uh, people like Linda DeCastaker who's the director of public health who sits in that, Sir Harry Burns who has a wealth of experience in dealing with these issues. So whilst we are resourcing and trying to deal with a lot of the short-term pressures around increases in um, advice services contracts, in increases in food bank uh, presentations, um, significant increases in DHP applications and associated rent arrears, um, the Council also spent all of its welfare fund resources that were given to it by the Scottish Government and supplemented that by £150,000 of its own resources. So... We feel we're doing everything we can in the short term to deal with the very immediate issues that the Council um, and Renfrewshire faces, but very, very concerned about um, the prospects for the future and um, the pressures that that brings to the public purse um, in the years to come. You mentioned the, the public purse and the UK government's intention here in terms of welfare reform was obviously uh, to save the Westminster government uh, money. Um, uh, do you think that what we are seeing, even with the mitigations that have been put in place by the Scottish Government, which uh, it is a form of cost shunting, that there is further cost shunting because you, um, as a local authority, are also having to put in additional resources to deal um, with the pressures that are put on because of these welfare reforms? Would that be fair to say? Um, th there's certainly um, there's certainly been significant additional cost pressures as a result of the welfare changes at, at, at a local level, and I recognise the additional resources that the Scottish Government have put in. Um, I, I mean, it, the sorts of issues that that, that we are currently uh, dealing with are the the maintenance of the council tax reduction scheme um, to to replace council tax benefit, um, the welfare fund a uh, top up. Um, both at a national and a local level. Um, I think there are also issues which haven't been mentioned yet in relation to um, support for job search activity in, in the area as a result of the application of uh, sanctions um, for uh, benefit claimants. Um, the, the benefit admin subsidy at a local level has been cut by 25% over uh, the last three years um, at the same time as we're seeing a 20-fold um, increase in the, the, the level of uh, benefit changes at a local level. So um, whilst our um, administration subsidy has been reduced by the UK government, we, we have been expected to um, obviously carry the, the burden of all of the, implement all of the, the changes at a local level. Um, we're, we're also obviously dealing with the, the rent arrears issue, which is a, an additional cost pressure at local level. And, and I think in the long term, 
um, the financial sustainability of uh, social housing over the long term must be a, a major concern, both at a local and a national level. And the, the discretionary housing payments, um, both locally and nationally, have been an additional pressure. So certainly, um, whether, whether you describe it as cost shunting, but certainly um, we've experienced a significant additional cost pressure at a local level as a result, a direct result of the welfare changes. Um, can I ask uh, the panellists if there has been any contact with the UK government um, in terms of, of these additional cost pressures? Have they actually uh, been in touch with you to see what impacts their welfare reform policies are having on the ground? Mrs Bruce? Yes, there's, there's been a, a, a dialogue, a periodic dialogue between uh, the leadership of the Council and Lord Freud so that the um, issues experienced are con continuing to, to um, be noted. And I think it's important that um, the facts on the ground are, are conveyed to, to the decision makers on the policy. And I should also um, point out that we do recognise that, you know, where it's the law of the land, we do our best to implement it and mitigate, um, mitigate the impact of, of the policy as we see it. If I, if I might just um, broaden a bit, I think um, a point which is aligned a bit to something Elmer mentioned, we've noticed a bit of pressure in kinship carers, and that's um, added just over a quarter of a million of pressure for us of people coming forward looking for more support. So I think it's, it goes slightly beyond the people who are directly impacted by the policy, but to those that surround, um, if you like, their caring network and so on. And I think we've all, all councils are making a huge effort in terms of both employability, as Sandra mentioned, but also um, the provision of housing and trying to right-size the housing that we have for the population that we have. And that does require a, a really different approach to how we fund and, and find land and so on and so forth to assemble the right resources to create the housing that we need. So I think um, looking at this policy is really important to look at it in the round with all of those things around about employability. In Edinburgh, we've made big inroads in youth unemployment, but I appreciate that the economy that we've got in Edinburgh is probably well suited to, to meet some of those challenges. Um, but it's just seeing this in the round with all of the associated policy areas, I think, is crucial. Ms Murray? I probably don't have anything to add, to be honest, Chair, uh, to what uh, my colleague Sue Bruce has said. I absolutely agree with, with everything she's, she's brought to your attention. I would just be saying the same again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, we, we, we've had quite a lot of uh, contact done, quite a lot of lobbying, both at officer level and at member level, uh, including meetings with Lord Freud. Uh, we have a, a corporate welfare reform group which comprises officers and members at local level. And we have regular meetings at that with a number of um, members of parliament. Uh, Danny Alexander, John Thurso and Charles Kennedy have been regulars. Um, we've also been involved in the COSLA lobbying, uh, including uh, meetings about local sports services in London. Um, and we do have in place now, because we are a live universal credit site, we do have in place a service delivery agreement covering the two years up to March 15. And I'm pleased to say that we reached agreement only this morning with DWP on the funding uh, for that uh, after uh, some fairly protracted negotiation. The funding is not over generous, but it is sufficient to uh, deal with the, uh, the marginal costs, if you like, of the additional uh, work that the Council is uh, uh, required to carry out under the uh, support services that we provide uh, for the Department. The Highland are getting a little bit of extra attention because you're a pilot area for universal credit. Would that maybe be fair to say? Uh, well, we, we're even more than a pilot, uh, Chairman. We're, we, we're a live site and uh, obviously they are keen for that to be a success. Okay, thank you. Thank Alec you. Crowley, please. In terms of the bedroom tax and and the DHP, is each council, I mean, can you confirm that your council is stating very, very clearly to people that if they apply for DHP, then they will not be liable to pay bedroom tax um, 
and that it will be mitigated. And I notice in the evidence that you've given, you, you, you do talk about some of the measures that you are taking to try and increase the, the uptake, because my understanding is that people have to apply. And I wonder if you can maybe give us an update on that in terms of what progress you're making and so far what the, the numbers are like in terms of the numbers of people that, that are applying or are not applying, perhaps more importantly. Ms Black. Uh, yes, happy to um, respond on that question, Chair. Um, Renfrewshire have um, been working uh, very hard um, through our housing services teams to ensure a, a maximum uptake on our discretionary housing uh, payments. We have, um, between the, the, the council and its uh, local RSLs, um, we have, however, experienced um, on our own um, tenancies a 40% level of um, no applications to the, to the discretionary housing payments uh, budget and our local RSLs are experiencing 34% um, of a uh, no uptake of a uh, discretionary housing payment. So they've made no application to the council, despite significant levels of engagement from our housing services staff with, with those tenants. And the, one of the points I wanted to make to the committee was that those tenants tend to be in the most deprived areas of, of the Renfrewshire um, geographical area. Um, I think the, um, the, the other thing um, I would just say is that the, the discretionary housing payments budget for Renfrewshire was fully expended in 2013-14. So um, I wouldn't want you to give you the impression that we, we didn't spend the resources that were available to us um, in, at, at their fullest level. Um, and, and the other point I just wanted to make was that discretionary housing payments um, budgets at the moment are also there to, to support um, non-bedroom tax cases. Um, they have been used for um, fin other financial needs for uh, tenants requiring support with, with rent. And in 13-14 in Renfrewshire, 22% of our expenditure in DHP was on non-bedroom tax cases. So there, there is still a need for, at the moment, under the current arrangements, for all tenants to make application um, and for there then to be a financial assessment made as to whether um, we make an award of discretionary housing payments. So one, one of the issues I think we, we face at the moment is a perception that the bedroom tax problem um, has, has been removed from all tenants. And at the moment, the experience in Renfrewshire is that that, that, is, that that is not the case because of the process that we are required to to use to, to make DHP payments. Pick up before Absolutely, we go Mr. On the process, because my understanding for talking to Fife Council was that that basically people who are liable for bedroom tax, the process has been very much simplified. The form has been simplified. They complete the form. It's it's automatically then approved, and that person then will will receive or will, will not be liable for bedroom tax. Is, I mean, is that how how you see it? We've simplified the, the, the process in, in, in similar ways. Um, I, I think the problem we have is that we have difficulty actually getting tenants to make application. And in that case, we are unable to make a payment. Mr Lamont, do you want to comment on the DHP bedroom tax issue? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, similar comments in, 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 a, in a way. We spent something like 78% of our, of our total... Uh, we, we did effectively uh, neutralise the bedroom tax for um, our, our own council tenants and we're continuing to work on others. We have a shortened application process. We are prepared to, to backdate where appropriate and have done uh, a, a fair bit of that um, and are continuing to increase the publicity about DHPs in the area and working with our customers. Hi. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, s similar to, to what you've heard from, from colleagues, the, the Council has fully expended its, its DHP and, and added to that as well. Um, we have streamlined the process as far as we possibly can at this stage. It's fair to say, though, that for 14-15, we're still awaiting final confirmation of all the funding available to ensure that we can, in fact, um, mitigate the full, the full costs of um, all of the, the, the likely claimants um, as we see it. We do have a small number of claimants that um, currently do not 
um, engage with us and we are working very hard. We've got that down to just below 100 as of the, the last report I received in the last year or so, so we're very pleased with that. Um, but it is um, very much a, a work in progress for us and we are doing everything we possibly can to support people. Mrs Bruce. Yes, thanks. Um, just in relation to the, the application process, um, the, the regulations require there to be an application, obviously, to be considered for DHP, but we are um, taking that not to necessarily mean a written application. If we're contacted verbally by telephone by an advocate, we will take that as an application. Equally, if we detect people in the system who we think um, are eligible and haven't made an application, we'll contact them to seek their permission for us to speak to them about applying um, a discretionary housing payment. And um, if somebody applies during the course of 14-15, we will seek to backdate that to the beginning of, well, to the 1st of April 14, so that they're not disadvantaged by not being quick um, with their application. Okay. Mr Riley. I think in terms of evidence, there's a whole load of stuff which clearly shows that local government is at the, the front line of this, and it would be possible to go through it all today. But could I home in on housing? Um, and again, I suspect you're not able to give me the figures, but would you be able to provide to the committee some detail on your housing waiting lists, like the numbers, homelessness, transfer, medical, etc., on your lists themselves, and also perhaps some detail in terms of the housing programmes that you have in place in terms of housing build. I was interested that, that, that Mrs Black talked about the, the future financial sustainability of social housing, and I wasn't sure what you meant on that, so perhaps you can maybe say a bit more about that. But really the, one, the thing I want to home in on is Shelter Scotland argue that, that basically we need a programme of 10,000 houses being built per year um, for, for social housing, for rented housing. I mean, what is your view in terms of the general pressure that, 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 that you're under and, and your area? And is housing tenure leading to increased inequality and poverty in your area? Ms Black? Um, I can certainly pick up on the um, issue about the financial sustainability. Um, our concerns are that the, the level of uh, non-payment of rent in um, the, the last financial year um, has, has um, been masked to a certain extent by the application of discretionary housing payments to, to those rent accounts and also a device that the Council has used locally, uh, which is referred to in our submission called the Council Tenants Assistance Fund, which I know has been a subject of a discussion at a Scottish Government level. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that the, the rent arrears for 2013 as a result of the application of both of those uh, funds has meant that rent arrears have remained relatively stable between the end of 2012-13 uh, and 13-14, so no significant increase. I think if those mechanisms were removed at any point in the future, and I think at the moment they are seen as short-term fixes, then rent arrears would would, would increase significantly, um, in, f in certainly in Renfrewshire's own housing revenue account. When you add that to the potential um, introduction of direct payments under universal credit, where um, universal credit and existing housing benefit is, is paid directly to the tenant rather than the landlord as exists at the moment, then we would see arrears getting potentially to, to such a level that the financial sustainability, so the rent account, which is ring-fenced in local government um, and must stand on its own two feet financially, um, that would become extremely difficult uh, where expenditure um, would exceed income as a result of arrears and um, not only our ability to invest in the future um, investment in our housing stock but also our ability to, re to repay the debt as a result of past investment would become a real problem uh, for, for, the, for the housing revenue account and, and, and that's, that's what I was referring to and, and I would imagine based on discussions with our local RSLs that they, they face um, similar prob problems particularly where they're extremely small um, housing associations and their capacity to deal with that in the short term is, is a real issue for them. Does anyone else have anything else to add there? Mr Lamont. Yes, I, I could simply add that um, 
In, in terms of the rural environment, um, we, we are concerned also to, to increase the numbers of one- and two-bedroomed houses as, as a response effectively to, to, to universal credit. It may not be an ideal situation in terms of flexibility of family circumstances and so on, but that is an important issue. And basically, you need a healthy housing revenue account in order to have the funds to invest in that stock as well as the, the, the general stock. Yeah. Mrs. Bruce. Yeah, just um, certainly we'll provide that um, information to you and we'll try and provide some kind of analysis about how it sits with the transient population. We've got 100,000 students in Edinburgh, so there's quite an active RSL um, environment in Edinburgh and there are issues in there about the level of um, rents in the private rented sector, which means that the average price for householders is, is high in Edinburgh. The um, percentage of properties under-occupied, as I've mentioned, the council properties, we've got um, stock of just under 20,000, of which um, just over 3,000 are impacted by under-occupancy, of which 44% 40 have got arrears. That rises through um, RSL um, properties to one which has um, of 448 properties. There are 49 under-occupied, of which 100% have got arrears so that there's a there's a wide range of um of um factors in there in terms of the differences um that different landlords are facing um so what we will do is bring certainly bring that information back as well as plans for house building there are there were for example two areas in edinburgh um, muir house and craig miller which were cleared for um new housing um but 2007 were hit by the recession so there are large areas which are due to be built out, and we're now seeking partnerships and so on to build those out. But I would imagine that is a picture that's similar across the land, and we need to, as a result of the change to this policy, since those cl clearances were made, if you like, to make way for new houses, we need to make sure that we've got enough houses that match the occupancy needs of the population that we have and understand that and build into that um, barrier-free housing, which links back to my earlier comment about pressure on the health and, health and social care budgets so that more people can live in at home in the right size of home with the right conditions. So we'll bring as much of that information forward as we can. Thank you. Mrs Murray, please. Yeah, just, just to add to, to what Sue Bruce, Bruce has said, we'll certainly bring back the information that um, uh, Mr Rowley has asked for. Um, in, in terms of um, the Council's uh, work specifically around house building, we did have a 10-year <coughs> plan to build um, 500 houses over that, that period of 10, year, 10 years, which would be um, a funded through a, 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 a range of measures, not least um, government support, but also um, the, the council's um, own uh, house building support um, as well. That is definitely coming under pressure now, and we have, uh, we're undertaking a piece of work at the moment to look at what our house building plans can be, but also what the shape of that house building and what the shape of the future stock should look like. And I'm very happy to, to, to give that information to the committee once we've finished that piece of research. Thank you. Um, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, just to follow on from the questioning from Alec Rowley, and I'm particularly interested in Sue Bruce's response in relation to the 100% arrears in the RSL sec the, the section that you mentioned, uh, and within your own housing stock, Edinburgh City Council housing stock, the arrears that are there form the under-occupancy. Could the panel indicate why we're seeing those level of arrears when we're supposed to have discretionary housing payments in place? Uh, because surely if the discretionary housing payments are being applied as they should be, and I do recognise that there are people in Sandra Black outlined that 40 almost 40% 40 of those who may be entitled to DHP have not applied for it. But why have we seen those levels of errors and, and is it additional pressures rather than just the under-occupancy issue? Mrs Bruce. Th that's something that we're actually working on to understand. I should emphasise that there was a range all the way through. So some RSLs have got 22% arrears relating to under-occupied under right up to one that's got 100%. So there are different um, patterns of action going on. We need to understand, um, I know the council itself has got um, a no evictions policy for under-occupancy and we've had to be careful to make sure that um, 
that no evictions policy was related to under occupancy and not just seen as a as a blanket no evictions policy for maybe other reasons. Um, and we're working with our RSLs as closely as possible to understand why there are differences and to ensure that they are supported in rolling out the um, discretionary housing payments. We can perhaps bring back more information on that to you. I was just, just going to add um, to Mr Wilson that um, as part of our DHP funding, um, councils do actually um, make payments to um, not just RSLs but to private sector as well where, where applications are coming through. So, so it's not a case that there isn't any of that money getting out there. Mm. You wanted to come in as well? Um, yeah. Just really to, to stress that uh, because of the council's local device, um, we, we have reduced the, the rent arrears on our own housing revenue account. DHP on its own would not have been sufficient to, um, to cover that, so there has been a significant contribution from the council's own um, housing revenue account reserves, which have reduced the arrears um, in the Renfrewshire area. Okay. Mr Lamont, do you want to add anything? Um, at the end of April, uh, Chairman, we had 588 council tenants affected by the bedroom tax in arrears, but that is down on the similar down by 2.6 per cent on the similar figure in the previous year. So, the combination of DHPs plus the work that is being done to to advise tenants, the work being done by our housing colleagues as well, uh, is having an impact. Uh, Given some of the figures we've heard this morning, uh, and Sandra Black outlined 100% of the DHP allocation funding has been used in terms of the, the applicants so far, I think Ms Murray gave a figure of 78% uh, of the DHP funding being used. If the figures that you've quoted this morning uh, are correct and there is a underclaiming of DHP, what financial pressures does that put on the local authorities to ensure that every tenant or it is, in, that is entitled to a discretionary housing payment actually receives that payment if you've already maximised the, the amount of money that's available at the present time? Um, Mrs Black, first I think you said it was last year you utilised all of the, the, the money, last financial year. Do you want to... We did, um, yes. Um, I mean, I understand there are um, still some resources at a Scottish Government level that have to be distributed, um, and certainly the representations that um, my own council have been making is that, that um, the distribution of that resource should be um, directly linked to the under-occupancy level um, within each council. So, so we would hope to receive um, a higher level of discretionary housing payment budget um, in 14-15 than we had in 13-14. Uh, uh, um, I, I think the other point I would make is if we could uh, come to agreement um, across Scotland about how to um, remove the need for an application from every tenant, then that would go a substantial way towards um, alleviating the pressure not just on the council in terms of the administration of the process, but also the pressure and distress that puts on individuals um, when they're contacted by the council to make that application. So I think if we could remove the need for that, and that was done on an all Scotland basis, then that would be a substantial step forward for us. Anyone else want to add to that? Mr. Mr. Lamont, sorry. Chairman, if I could just say, to you, I, I agree with my, my colleague Sandra on that. I would also make the point that during 13-14, we received the DHP funds incrementally. Um, and, you know, there, was a, there is a natural caution in local authorities. If there can be certainty of available funds mm -hmm. at the earliest possible date, there is probably as good a chance of, of, of spending that as there would otherwise be. Awesome. Thank you, Convener. Just to follow up on the issue about the allocation of DHP to local authorities, what's the panel's view on the original formula that was used by Westminster in calculating the level of DHP that would be required by local authorities? Mrs Black. Now, I think the, the original uh, formula um, has, has changed slightly uh, between 13-14 and 14-15, um, there is more recognition of the, the benefit 
changes that have taken place. So there is a slightly greater recognition of under-occupancy, for example, in the distribution of the UK resources. Um, but certainly um, from a Renfrewshire perspective, we, we think that the, the distribution could be improved further. Um, we think it's, it's based on uh, statistics um, which are historical um, and, and doesn't take enough account of the, the, the demands that are in our communities for discretionary housing payments. So we would like to see that shift um, take a, a further step forward. Does anyone else wish to add to that? Mr. Lamont. Sorry. Just, just uh, clearly the rural dimension is important to, to, to Highland and to similar placed councils. So I would ask that to be continue to be taken into account. Sir Wilson. One final question, Convener, and that is the fair uh, of some of the work that's been done by the voluntary sector, uh, the advice services, and in particular the food banks that have been created throughout Scotland. If the voluntary sector, the advice services, and the food banks were not there and not in place, what additional financial pressures would that place on local authorities? Mrs. Bruce, I, th I think, um, and I commented at the outset that we found those uh, that collegiate work with <coughs> voluntary sector and other agencies extremely helpful. I mean that we have noticed um, an increase in um, demand on advice services, for example, and working collegiately with Citizens Advice and others, um, housing associations, private landlords. Um, other parts of the voluntary sector are extremely helpful. So I think um, we haven't actually quantified what the difference would have been, but I think the aggregate value of the voluntary sector in this is um, <coughs> indisputable, and we would look to continue those partnerships. Yeah, I, I think as, as well as the, the voluntary sector uh, or voluntary agencies um, that you've mentioned um, and, and food banks, um, there's also credit unions, which uh, a number of us will be um, trying to push a lot harder um, mm -hmm. than we currently have. I mean, at the end of the day, if people don't have enough money, then even a credit union isn't going to be able to deal with that. But at least helping people to manage the money that they do have in the most effective way is, is hugely important. Um, a number of, of councils, my own included, will have provided um, probably additional support by way of funding to citizens' advice services to allow them to cope with increased demand as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think that's, that's hugely important um, for the future. Um, so, I think um, trying to ask us to see what would what would it be like if we didn't have the voluntary sector is um, pretty difficult because um, we do and we are making probably much better use of the voluntary sector than than we will would have done in the past. And the voluntary sector are definitely stepping up to the to the plate to to work with us on this. Mr. Lamont. Um, Chairman, I, I wouldn't underestimate the the role of community planning in all of this, particularly at local level. Um, we, we work very closely in Highland with our uh, CAB colleagues and uh, all, all of the third sector, and uh, I, I think that is the only way forward when, when we're faced with the situation we are. Mrs Black. Uh, nothing to, to really add, Chair. I agree with um, the comments that have been made about the role of the voluntary sector. Thank you very much. Anne McTaggart, please. Hi, David. Thanks, Convener. Um, um, Still in morning, it feels like afternoon. Um, the the impact. I know um, one of the charities have brought out a report today about the impact on children um, that has obviously the, the poverty aspect of it. Can you describe um, what measures that you have put in place within your environments to try and eradicate the impacts on poverty on children? Mrs. Black. Um, yes, I, I mentioned earlier one of the um, one of the bigger issues that my own council has taken forward is the poverty commission, which um, the focus is on child poverty levels in Renfrewshire, which we are very concerned about. It's still in its early stages. Um, the second meeting of the commission is is this Friday, and we're starting to look at the um, the links between poverty and um, health. And we are anticipating that there'll be a range of actions and recommendations coming out of that that the council and its community planning partners will take forward um, over the longer term. In, in the meantime, um, Renfrewshire Council over the last two years have been investing heavily in early years services. 
Um, we have um, two pilots running in Fergusley Park and uh, Linwood, two of the most deprived areas in our um, in constituency. And um, the, the early signs of that are that that is proving uh, successful. It's a, it's a sort of wraparound mm -hmm. service around families and children who are living in poverty, trying to pull together services both from the council, from the community planning partners and from the voluntary sector to ensure a more holistic approach to um, supporting families, um, whether it's through uh, childcare arrangements, kinship care, uh, debt, debt advice, employability services, they're all in the one place at the one time at, the, at a school level. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to provide uh, further information on that if that was uh, required. Sorry, just certainly, to, wait, yeah. um, to drill further into that, the, the evaluation of all that, will that be taken to the group that you had mentioned earlier, or how long will you take before you start evaluating that and take the good from it and, and move it elsewhere? Yes, the, it, they are actually attending the, the commission meeting on Friday, so we're very much linking... Um, the, the two initiatives together um, because we we are very aware um, that um, the impacts of poverty start at a very early age and obviously determined to, to try and prevent that happening um, where, wherever possible. So the, the pilot, the results of these pilots are being evaluated on a constant basis. It's been led by our Director of Education um, and the Convener of Education um, and certainly um, we're, we're confident that we will be able to use that as, as part of informing the Commission's findings. Ms Bruce. Thanks. Um, we have a, a welfare reform core group which is developing a strategy similarly <coughs> to that um, <coughs> in Renfrewshire. And the objectives are um, the prevention of hardship and worsening equality, um, looking at effective responses um, to meet crisis needs for housing, heat and food. Um, to support vulnerable children, families um, and extended families and to work as a partnership across, across the agencies to sustain um, Edinburgh's social economy. So that is a work in progress and I can certainly send information on in relation to that. We also have through the Edinburgh Partnership, which is the Community Planning Partnership, a poverty and equality um, themed working group. And they've recently done a very detailed analysis of poverty and inequality in Edinburgh, along with um, projections for the way we think the, the trends are going over the next several years. Um, I'm actually separated from my iPad, which has the details, but so I won't quote any numbers from memory, but um, would be happy to send on that analysis as well. From memory, it does show an increase um, of the number of children expected to be living in officially designated poverty in Edinburgh by 2020, which is a concerning trend. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of points maybe add to, to what's already, already been said. Um, clearly, North Eastshire is, is concerned as any other um, area about the, the, the potential for an increase in child poverty when our starting position at the moment is that 25% of the children that live in North Eastshire are, are living in poverty. Um, across the Community Planning Partnership, we have, um, we're in the, the middle of a uh, re- um, evaluating our inequality strategy to take some of the latest information more into account in our work and to direct our actions appropriately on the back of that. So that's a work in progress just now. Um, within, uh, in, in relation to the benefits cap, which started to kick in last year for us, we had 69 households that were affected by the benefits cap, but unfortunately those households contained 166 children. Um, we've done a lot of work um, to mitigate the impact on those children and the, the way in which that works in North Asia is that there is an automatic referral the minute we, are, we understand that the, the benefits cap has been applied um, to our social service children and families and money matters service to make sure that they get immediate and appropriate support to um, uh, support those families and children. Um, like Renfrewshire, we've done a lot of work in our early year service and now have welfare advice officers that sit as a part of the early year service uh, staff and go in and provide um, support to um, parents and carers within our early year service. And, and one of the initiatives that um, I'm not ashamed to say we pinched from Renfrewshire Council this year was that uh, we started to provide, at a very practical level, um, school meals during the school holidays. Pinching that's export and best practices, and all. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lamont. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, our uh, Head of Children's Services is represented on our uh, Corporate Welfare Reform Group, which, which meets regularly. Uh, like other councils, we, we are committed to the early years. Um, it, uh, what I would say is we, we, we have a real concern uh, in, in, in Highland that you know children do require to be fed by food banks. Um, that, that just feels entirely uh, wrong. And it's interesting that at the end of December 13, um, the, the reason for 49% of family referrals to food banks, according to the information I have, was either benefit uh, delays or changes. Um, so that's a, that's a big item. Thank you. Anne, do you want to come back? No, no, I think I'm fine, thanks. Thank Stuart McMillan, please. Um, yeah, okay, okay, I'll pose a question first of all just on the food banks. Um, also, we have the figures uh, from uh, Mr Lamont regarding uh, Highland, but I'd be grateful if uh, certain of the other local authorities, if you could certainly send information uh, regarding the, the numbers of people who are on food banks in your areas, because the, the, there's no information within the submissions. Or else, if you have them to hand now, that would be helpful. Sure, okay. if you'd like me to provide that. Okay. Um, the number of people fed uh, during 2013-14 from the Paisley Food Bank was 4,590. That was a 700% increase on the previous, the previous year. And um, the early indications from the first, um, first two months of 2014-15 would suggest that the 13-14 figures um, will double during 14-15. Does anyone else have the figures to hand? Mrs Murray, please. Um, I can confirm to the committee that um, 4,345 food bank vouchers were um, issued um, actually between December 2012 and April 2014, so over a 15-month period. Um, 2,677 of those had been redeemed, um, but uh, 3,354 adults and 1,558 children had received food from food banks. Um, again, those uh, when we look at the analysis of those, those tend to be in the areas of um, most significant deprivation within North Ayrshire. <coughs> Do you have, I don't have that figure to hand? But uh, if, if we it. could get them, I think that would be sure. extremely useful. Um, can I take John Wilson in for a just, very brief supplementary? Just a brief supplementary on that. The, it's good to get figures on the number of food banks and referrals to food banks. Have any of the local authorities identified where there are gaps in the provision of food banks? Because not every area is covered by a food bank. And I know that a significant cost can be incurred for those individuals who are referred to food banks. Um, Mr Lamont, uh, probably a worse situation in terms of gaps in rural areas. Uh, Chairman, I, I, I know that uh, over the last 12 months or so, some of these gaps have been filled. Uh, in particular, I know that Blycewood opened four new food banks in Aviemore, Kyle, Fort William and Thurso. So the supply ha ha has been put in place to, 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 to meet the demand. And um, most recently, there has been a food bank centre opened in Nairn. So these are, you know, if that's one authority, um, it must be replicated across the board. Yeah. Mrs Black? Yeah, I, I don't have information on gaps with me, but I am aware that the hours of opening is, is an issue as well in our um, existing uh, food bank because it's run on a voluntary basis, obviously. Mrs Murray or Mrs Bruce? Uh, the uh, exact numbers. I, I do know that there are two new food banks have opened recently in different parts of the city, bringing um, the total up, as, as I understood it, to four, which were food banks standing alone. But there are other um, agencies, such as Cyrenians, who provide a, r a wide range of services, which would include um, the distribution of food. So it wouldn't be a standalone food bank, but we'll get that information as well. I think that would be extremely useful, and I, I think some of that information has already been supplied to the Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee from right. some of your councils, so it, it wouldn't take a great deal of work, I don't think. Mr McMillan. Well, thank you. Uh, certainly, a number of months ago, uh, I had a, a members' debate uh, in the Parliament on the issue of food banks, uh, but certainly from what you've said today, that uh, the situation seems to have moved on uh, for, uh, for the worse, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, in terms of the impact, uh, on, uh, on your own uh, council budgets. So it's, it certainly sounds as if there has been a, uh, a further uh, negative impact upon your budgets. Would that be a correct assessment? Mrs Bruce? 
I think the, uh, I mean, things like loss of rental income are a concern if you just take housing alone, but the pressure across the board is definitely tangible. And we're currently um, working on a plan in Edinburgh to um, remove 326 million from our revenue turnover by 2018, just to stand still. And we're looking, offices are making recommendations for to create headroom in that for space for new investment. So there is pressure across the board on all budget areas. And it's, it's difficult to say how much of that percentage-wise is attributed directly to something like welfare reform, but there are definitely impacts. I've mentioned um, health services, social services, mental health. We've talked about kinship care, housing, um, rental income, and so on and so forth. So it's, you know, it's easy to see how the, the impact can spread. Mrs Murray. Nothing to add to, to what Super has said. Mrs Black. Just to add that my own council um, is very keen to invest in the prevention agenda and the, the pressures that are, that are on our budget, both as a result of um, reductions in public expenditure and having to deal with these issues um, makes, that, makes that incredibly difficult. Mr Lamond. Perhaps if I could just add to what I said previously about food bank coverage, I believe there are also plans to launch further uh, food bank projects in Allness, Dingwall and Tain. So clearly that's beginning to mop up the, the Highland environment. But there are pressures on my council's budget as well, obviously. And uh, welfare reform, in some respects, has to be pr given priority treatment. Sir McMillan. In terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, your budgets uh, and the planning, um, that's uh, in terms of regarding the welfare reform. Um, uh, did you have enough time to actually uh, plan and uh, and and uh, adjust your budgets um, uh, as a consequence of the welfare reform agenda? You take uh, one word answers here as well, uh, Mrs. Bruce, please. Briefly, I think local government is good at responding to things at short notice, but we, you know, we've certainly adjusted as we've gone along. So there was an immediate response. Um, followed by an incremental adjustment. I, I, I would agree with what Sue, Sue said. Um, for, from, from North Ayrshire's point of view, we, we set up a, an officer working group to deal with this because we, we knew or we had a, a, an indication of what was, was coming down the line with welfare reform. And I guess um, when you've worked in local government for a number of years, you can make some, some assumptions about what some of the impacts are likely to be. Um, and then alter that accordingly as, as some of that happens in, in practice and you know some things become an actual impact and other things are perhaps not as bad as you'd perhaps envisage or some things might be worse. So we do do adjust as we go, go along. Um, so we've, we've been running with this for um, over two years now in terms of our officer working group and I would imagine most councils are in a similar position um, constantly adjusting and amending. Um, I think it's also important to recognise that local elected members um, in most councils, if not all, will be receiving regular reports so that they can uh, alter and, and hone the approach that, that they've been taking towards managing this and mitigating it as best they can in their local areas. Thank you. Mr Lamont. Thank you, Chairman. My, my council uh, resources committee is actually meeting today to look at uh, creating a welfare fund, pulling together the different strands uh, that we're, we're spent, you know, of our spending on, uh, on, on welfare issues. Um, what I would say is uh, we think it's probably the calm before the storm at the moment. Universal credit um, will start to bite um, and uh, it'll probably bite first in, in, in the Inverness area. Okay. Mrs Black. I suppose the, the, the timing of the additional cost pressures um, at a local level certainly with um, quite significant cuts in our budget has been um, most unhelpful. Um, um, but we are very concerned about um, if universal credit is implemented in 2016, then there are other more, much more significant cost pressures that local government will have to deal with. Thank you. Very briefly, Mr McMillan. Uh, and just one the final brief question. Uh, have any of your local authorities made any direct representations to the UK government regarding the welfare reform agenda and the impacts that it will have upon your budgets? Mrs Black. Um, I'm aware that there have been meetings with uh, UK ministers 
um, to, to emphasise the difficulties that, that we have and um, correspondence between the, um, the Leader of the Council and, and, and the UK Parliament, but I've, I don't have details of that with me. Mr Lamont, you've already explained yes, some of your detail. I, I, I indicated earlier, Chairman, we, we've met face to face with Lord Fried, both at member level and at officer level. Um, and we've made representations through COSLA also. Mrs Murray? Yes, as, as well as meetings with Lord Freud and um, David Mundell, we, we have also um, uh, been using our local MPs to um, lobby quite uh, proactively on behalf of the, the Council's area. Um, it's not the leader, actually, that's been writing to, to Lord Freud and David Mundell. It's actually been me <laughs> on behalf of the administration of the Council um, making making sure that uh, David Mundell and Lord Freud are, are fully up to date and they get almost a quarterly report from me about uh, what's happening in North Ayrshire. Mrs Bruce. Similar picture, contact being maintained with Lord Freud and Mr Mundell. OK, thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can I take you back to your no evictions policy? I'm well aware that Edinburgh has a no evictions policy. Do any other councils have it? And also, are there any other... <laughs> sanctions that you levy for people who are substantially in arrears? What, was, what is your policy? Mrs Murray? Yes, we, we have a, a no evictions policy as long as uh, tenants are engaging with us and that policy was updated in uh, at the beginning of May which now says that um, as well as uh, whether they're engaging with us, if we believe that there are other actions that we can take to try and mitigate the impact of arrears, and these are particularly in relation to under-occupancy, so we have that in place at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Are there any other sanctions, sanctions you, you, you levy if people are substantially in arrears? Yeah. Um, obviously, um, before um, we were dealing with under-occupancy, the Council would have had a, a policy which dealt with, with evictions, and we, we do still um, use that where um, the cause um, may be something other than under-occupancy. Mr Lamont, please. Same response, Chairman, as for North Ayrshire. OK. Uh, Mrs Black. Is similar to, to the other councils, um, and we're, I think our approach is more to, to support and try and help uh, people uh, pay their rent arrears. We believe if sanctions are applied, um, that they will present elsewhere in the council, either through uh, social work services or through our homelessness uh, unit. It is Bruce. Exactly the same. Um, similar position. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. That's, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very Mark much. McDonald, please. I think I'm right in saying that through universal credit, tenants will become responsible for paying rent directly to councils. What analysis have you done in terms of the likely impact that's going to have? Because obviously, while the Scottish Government is in the position now of putting in place, being able to put in place additional DHP to hopefully meet some of the shortfall that there has been, um, that would be a a uh, sort of secondary blow which which is coming on the horizon for councils and what analysis have you done about the impact that's going to have on your your rent or your levels i meant you're beginning to experience this now <laughs> uh, thank you chairman yes fr frankly the numbers are so low though that it's difficult to to, to draw any uh, r real conclusions from them um there will be an impact there is there is absolutely no doubt about that and in our council, um, the, the emphasis is, is very much on uh, giving people money advice where, where, where they need it. Well, there's actually a stage before that. There's financial education, which, which, which needs to, uh, to come into to place, come into play. But um, there's, there's money, uh, money advice, uh, which, uh, which has to be given. Um, and... Uh, We are in discussion with uh, DWP, you know, about the likely impact. Um, we know that they are revising projections, you know, in terms of how the the take up, the transfer of caseload is, is going to go within our council. Um, we are very happy to, to share that with the, the with the Parliament, but in, in fact. Yes, um, when it becomes available. In fact, you, you have civil servants represented on our on our local group, so that is that is quite useful as well. 
Uh, civil servants don't always feed things into this committee, <laughs> though, so it would be, we'd be very grateful to receive that from Highland Council. Uh, Mrs Black, please. Um, yes, uh, the first point I'd make is that um, there are significant levels. I don't have the exact figures, but it's, it's well over half of our rental income um, and, and certainly the housing's uh, the, the council's housing revenue account is is paid directly through um, housing benefit either in full or in part. Um, so the tenants are not actively having to to make um, rental payments uh, to to the council. That's dealt with directly. I think our experience of um, the impact of under occupancy, if that was mapped over to um, direct payments, then the council would immediately have a significant issue in terms of the collection of, of, of rent because it, it is made much more difficult for tenants to actually um, pay, pay their rent on time and um, in, in full in the way that is um, guaranteed at the moment through the housing benefit uh, regulations. And an add supplementary, which maybe Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Bruce could, could elaborate on as well. Given that you can see this coming on the horizon, what sort of proactive steps are you taking to engage with these tenants to ensure that uh, measures are put in place which will allow them to be able to to make these rental payments, and you don't come to the the point where universal credit is applied, these direct payments are are, are being made or or not being made, as is the case, and you're then having to take sort of mm -hmm. uh, action after the event. Yeah. Back. We have we have invested already in um, our advice services uh, provision in in the council, and we've we've moved away from a predominantly welfare rights focus, um, where the focus was on maximising uh, benefit uptake, to um, us trying to um, introduce much more financial awareness amongst our tenants and um, provide budgeting training and, and mm. such like. I, I, do, I do think there's a, an issue about timing, though, um, with the tenants at the moment. Many of them are currently dealing with the under-occupancy issue, um, and, and therefore I think it's a matter of timing in terms of um, when, do you, when do you start that, when do you um, prepare tenants, what's the best time for that, coupled with the, the whole uncertainty um, from the UK government at the moment over the introduction of universal credit. Um, we know it's 2016 at the moment, but councils at this stage um, have, have no indication of what their go-live date is and when it will actually affect their tenants directly. Just Bruce. Thanks very much. Um, I don't have an analysis of, of our forecast of the impact to hand, but we'll send anything on. But what we are doing is um, increasing our... Um, if you like contact with tenants, we're also working with tenants federations uh, representatives who have got very uh, detailed um, local knowledge of the families in their in their blocks or the area that they work in. Um, we're also taking um, an approach to this that the tenants who are facing these challenges are also customers, and we're interested in um, being aware of their customer satisfaction levels in terms of the roundness of the service that we provide to them. So it's not a one-dimensional service that we're providing to them. We have other other aspects of their tenancy to um, ensure that, that they're happy with. So the um, increased focus on support to tenants, approach to tenants, working with tenants representative organisations, and ensuring that we understand that they are demanding a service of us as well as we're expecting income from them. So it's kind of both sides of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that um, early on, um, councils did make representation to ministers about um, how the, the the payment of rent would could or uh, would be impacted by the introduction of uni universal credit, and there was a bit of early movement in in relation to how quickly you could move to automatic payment to landlords. Um, so that has changed since the initial reforms were were introduced. Um, within North Ayrshire, um, over 60% of our housing tenants uh, receive um, either full or part benefit payment. So we do expect there to be a very significant impact on our, our rent levels, um, but we have not um, estimated that as yet. Um, what, what we are doing just now, though, to prepare for that is, as you quite rightly said, um, we've undertaken a very, very strong campaign of engagement with tenants to work very closely with us because, um, as I, I think my colleague Sandra Black said earlier on, 
um, is, is better to, to try and get people to work with you um, rather than using perhaps sanctions a wee bit further down the line. And we, we do want to try and build up that strong relationship where people value their, their housing tenancy and the relationship that they have with the local council. Um, but as ever, um, again, taking from Sandra, uh, timing is crucial and it's when do we actually um, talk with tenants about this and, and discuss it with them because um, it's, it is the same people that are going to be impacted by universal credit as who have been impacted by the welfare um, reforms so far. Um, across Scotland, um, we, we um, do a lot of sharing on our communications work and our communications campaigns, and that's been, I think, uh, quite effective across Scotland in, in um, trying to help tenants understand what's happening to them and where to go for help and assistance, and, and also building tenants' confidence that we're there to help them as well. Um, and the, the other um, area that I wanted to touch on um, was around uh, the... the the Scottish uh, Government's uh, programme to um, build resilience for welfare reform programme, which is looking at some initiatives, and I know that councils are bidding, bidding into that to, to receive some funding. Um, and a number of us are looking at employability programmes, um, because the, the ultimate um, uh, aim for a number of us will be to try and help as many people who um, are not managing uh, to get through welfare reforms, the welfare reforms as well as um, they might otherwise, is because um, we want to get them into employment. Um, so the, the, big, the big issue for us, the end game for us, is, is more about employability. Thank you very much. Obviously, come 2016, the landscape may have changed somewhat, but we'll leave that for another day. Um, there's been some focus in terms of the impact on social care budgets and in, in the responses, and there seems to be, from the responses I've looked at, a lot of councils are saying they're not seeing a noticeable impact on social care budgets as against housing budgets. But has there been any impact in terms of eligibility for services as a result of uh, individuals' welfare entitlements changing? Has there been anything that you've noticed in that respect? Because obviously a lot of the responses are looking at whether there have been an increase in pressures on social care budgets. But obviously if individuals' entitlements and eligibility are altered, that would have a, 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 an ad, a, a reverse effect in terms of uh, these people would, would no longer perhaps be eligible for money to be spent on them. Has that been something that's been picked up? That actually is something that I don't have information on, but it's, I'll certainly go back and look at that. But what we are seeing is, is substantially higher demand in areas like unscheduled care. And we are looking at, at the causes of that. Um, you know, we haven't had a hard winter... Um, there are things that we would have expected to have impacted on unscheduled care, for example, and the question we were asking actually in a discussion as recently as yesterday was, a, was about the ability of families to look after their extended families, their older members of the family and so on and so forth. So that's a piece of work we're, we're doing at the moment to understand the root causes and we'd be happy, happy uh, to share that with you. For that, Mrs Black. Sorry, I don't have that information with okay. me today. Um, if, if you can find that as well, that would be useful. Mr Lamond. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Again, I'm aware of increased demand, but I would, we, we would have to get back to you on the details of that. Could, could I perhaps just mention um, about the... Sorry to go back, but the impact of universal credit. Um, according to the figures we have at the moment, and I would caution that this is only claimants with housing costs that are known to the council because under universal credit we're not entitled to know uh, basically who, who is claiming it. Um, seven out of nine are in some kind of arrears with, with the rent. So from the council's point of view there are, there are two issues. One is the speed of switchback payments get, get, getting those through and the second issue um, is the speed of getting people onto what's called personal budgeting support referrals. Um, the DWP have a gatekeeper role in that, probably because they will only pay if you know it's it's a formal referral from them. Um, so that has been particularly slow. Although I'm bound to say there has been a good deal of cooperation in the in Inverness, uh, and they're prepared to consider some kind of local referral arrangement that will speed that up. But I know it's something that will apply more widely. Ms Murray. 
Yes, I, I don't have the figures with me, but I can see, see quite clearly that we do have increased demand for our children and family services. Um, and I mentioned the, the benefit cap earlier on um, this morning. Um, we, we are also seeing increased demand in relation to mental health. Um, so I'll get some figures and I can get those sent on to the committee. Very briefly, one final Sorry, question, if I may, Commissioner. Um, we've focused on social care and housing budgets um, in the committee, but during the course of the evidence, one thing has struck me is that perhaps uh, looking more widely at other budgets, and one that is springing immediately to mind is the education budget, given the, the impact this is likely to have on children um, and the potential need for additional educational support that, that could arise as a result. Is that an analysis that your councils have undertaken or are those figures that perhaps we could be provided with later? Because obviously that would be a, a significant budget that would be affected. Has anyone carried out any analysis? Um, Mrs Black? Not specific analysis as such, but certainly the, the programme that I referred to earlier in terms of Families First and the, the wraparound services around children and families living in poverty, the council... Um, in its last budget, um, put about four and a half million pounds of its own resources in, into that programme for two schools in, in its areas. Um, so, um, if that's proven to be successful, I think that would be indicative of the level of resource that is needed to um, support children in those circumstances uh, moving moving forward. Mrs. Bruce. Yeah. Um, again, I don't have that information to hand, but I would t that ties in with the information that the Poverty and Inequality Group have been doing around about the additional demand that we anticipate. So happily send that information on as well. Does anyone else wish to add anything? Um, Mr Lamont. Chairman, we, we have uh, participated in the National Money Advice Outcomes Project, and I believe that there will be recommendations there in relation to uh, financial education. Um, finally, um, there was mention of uh, problems with data sharing uh, from the DWP um, to local authorities. Is that causing you difficulties in terms of being able to plan? Is that causing you difficulties in terms of being able to engage with folks who are badly affected by these welfare reforms? Mrs Black? Yeah. Yes, we've um, had some um, early indications of that through the, the move from DLA to PIP, which um, started this year. Mm -hmm. um, we were um, trying to work with DWP colleagues who sit in our welfare reform group in Renfrewshire to identify the individuals who would be affected by that change, but they were um, so that the council and particularly our social work services could make contact and support them through that process. Um, but unfortunately, because of data protection uh, legislation, um, we were unable to share that data. Um, and, and that is, 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 is a feature, I guess, of some of the, the difficulties that we face between the, the, the two parts of the public sector. Mr Lamont. Uh, Chairman, there's a balance between uh, client confidentiality and um, operational practicalities that has to be struck. Yeah. It's fair to say that in, in, in the Inverness site we're working through some of these. Um, I think there will be some movement by DWP, but there will be certain uh, barriers that, 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 that just won't go down. Um, so I, I think it's just something probably in the fullness of time that we have to learn to, to live with and accommodate one another. Mrs Murray. Yes, we, we are experiencing those problems um, in relation to the migration to personal independence payments and it is impacting on our ability to support people properly. Um, in addition to that, we, we also um, are uh, experiencing difficulty in getting information around sanctions and the re reasons and rationale for those sanctions, which again impacts on our ability to support people that come to us, particularly if they're destitute. Thank you. Mrs Bruce. Uh, nothing further to add. If there are any other issues, I'll bring those forward. Can I thank you all very much for your evidence today? That's extremely useful. Um, if we, you can provide us with this additional information, uh, that would be great. Uh, obviously, we're looking at the, the budgetary impacts on local government of uh, the cost shunting of welfare reform. Uh, so any, uh, any help that you can give us in that regard would be useful. Um, I suspend for a few minutes for a change of witnesses, please. <coughs>
Um, uh, good morning again, and uh, I welcome you to this uh, second session, which is a round table session, um, looking at uh, the impacts uh, of welfare reform on local government budgets. Uh, if we could maybe go round the table and introduce ourselves and give us a wee bit of a description about your organisations. Uh, I'll start. I'm Kevin Stewart. I'm the convener of the committee. Uh, my name is Keith Triber. I'm policy Mon manager at Citizens Advice Scotland, representing the 81 Citizens Advice Bureau across the country. I'm Cameron Buchanan, uh, MSP. Uh, Bill Gray. Uh, I work at Community Food and Health Scotland, uh, which was set up 16 years ago. Uh, for most of that, war, part of the Scottish Consumer Council, which became Consumer Focus. And for the past year, we've been part of uh, NHS Health Scotland. John Wilson, MSP, Deputy Convener of the Committee. I'm Rachel Bocci, I'm Policy and Research Manager at Shelter Scotland, and we provide advice and information services to people in uh, risk of homelessness, homeless or in bad housing. Hi, my name's Alec Rowley, and I'm an MSP for the Cow and Beef Constituency. I'm uh, John Dickey, I head up Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. Um, there's two aspects to our work. One is about influencing policy in the interests of low-income families and, 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 and with a view to preventing and eradicating child poverty. And feeding into that and alongside that is our um, second-tier welfare rights um, advice, information and training service where we support frontline workers across Scotland um, to ensure that they, they, they have the skills and the knowledge to maximise the incomes of, of families across Scotland. I thought you'd miss me out there, sorry. <laughs> Anne McTaggart, MSP for Glasgow Region. Uh, yeah, Dermot O'Neill from the Scottish League of Credit Unions. Uh, we represent 31 volunteer-led community-focused credit unions who collectively have around 34,000 members, about 32 million in savings and about 21 million in loans. Uh, Mark MacDonald, MSP, member of the committee and uh, MSP for the Aberdeen Donside constituency. I'm Francis Stewart. I'm the Research and Policy Advisor with Oxfam Scotland. Obviously, we're best known for our international work, but we've also operated a domestic poverty programme in Scotland since 1996. That works in the same way as our international development programme. We don't do frontline service delivery, but we support community groups to tackle poverty and malaria. Stuart Mallard, MSP for West Scotland and committee member. Thank you. Maybe if I could start the ball rolling by asking... Um, our guests here today, uh, what do you think uh, is the impact of welfare reform uh, on local government funding? Um, what are you finding uh, on the ground in each of your areas, um, the differences that there are uh, with um, that, what I have called cost shunting going on? Who wants to start the ball rolling? Dermot, please. 
I suppose looking at credit unions, first of all, from a membership perspective, we've experienced an overall increase in membership across all of our credit unions. And I think, interestingly, there's been a move from members joining to save to now joining to borrow. We experienced a similar surge of membership just after the initial credit crunch, but that surge of membership was about people um, joining to save, and that, that's, that, that kind of culture shifted somewhat. Um, there were more accounts open last year than there were in the previous year, and there's definitely been um, that increase in membership as a result of the increased media exposure that, that credit unions have, have experienced. Although there appears to be a, a narrowing of the of the social demographic of the members that are the new members that are joining, and we were nervous that there's an apparent um, reinforcing notion that credit unions are being again positioned as being for poor people, and that has has an insidious effect as as credit unions continue to have exposure. From a savings perspective, overall, there's an increase in the level of savings held as a result of the increased number of accounts that have been opened. But there's also been an increase in the value and frequency of savings withdrawals from credit unions as well, which suggests a lower retention of savings and an increase in the need to access money in a way that wasn't the general pattern of credit union behaviour. From a lending perspective, there's been an increase in the overall value of lending made by credit unions, again, as a consequence of the increased number of accounts that have opened. There's also been an increase in the, the number and frequency of loan applications, um, but there's also been an increase in the number of loan application rejections, um, which is something that credit unions have historically struggled with. Credit unions are naturally minded to help all people all of the time. But in this climate of austerity, and also from a credit union perspective, in this climate of increased capital requirements, credit unions are looking to mitigate the, the risk of bad debt by being more restrictive or being more prudent with their lending practices. Um, i give you an illustration of that. A £1,000 loan made by a, a typical community credit union will earn about £64 in interest. If that one £1,000 loan requires to be written off, it essentially cancels out 15 other good loans. So there's a very small margin for credit unions to sustainably and successfully operate in. There's also been an increase in the number of loan applications for payday-type loans, and that's again something that's causing concern and, and some tension within, within the credit union movement as to how best to, to react and to manage these, these new requests. It's essentially a, a dilemma that what is the cause of payday loan requests? And I, to quote the colleague uh, Kezia Dugdale, um, she, she often <clears throat> has referred to it as the need for payday loans is sometimes a result of being too much month left at the end of the money. And I think that encapsulates the, the dilemma that credit unions have in that particular space is, is the need for credit as a result of an un, unexpected occurrence or is the need for credit because there's not enough money to get through the calendar month? And that's a real dilemma for credit unions to struggle with. I'm really glad that you've managed to get that over to the committee. Um, but our main uh, focus here is looking at uh, local government um, and the impact of, um, of welfare reform on their budgets and how that is affecting um, your organisations. Obviously, the Welfare Reform Committee of Parliament is looking uh, at a more rounded view of this, but today we're trying to focus on that local government element. Is there any impact in terms of uh, the changes in local government budgets and the impact of welfare reform on credit unions? The, uh, undoubtedly, that there will be, and I suppose it is, is determined by the level of external um, funding that is required by individual credit unions to deliver the services that they do. There is no one answer catch all. It, the, the activities of individual credit unions will determine the level of external funding that they require. So, to answer the question in short, there will be an impact, but it is relative to the individual location and the individual credit union in question. Thank you. Um, can I take Keith and then I'll take Alec Dowley? Keith, please. 
Um, just to give you a bit of background on what we're seeing, um, these are just provisional figures, but they say that the um, Bureau dealt with over half a million, 550,000 new issues last year, which is a 9% increase on the previous year. Uh, and of that, over 200,000 were new benefits issues, which is nearly 570 for every day. Um, but it's not just the numbers, it's the uh, the types of cases. We're seeing increasingly complex uh, cases that are hard to deal with. Uh, and increasingly people who are in crisis and desperation, types of cases we wouldn't have seen uh, a couple of years ago. People haven't eaten, can't afford heat heating, and in other words, are, are very close to destitution. Uh, in terms of uh, local authorities, um, the biggest increases we're seeing is in housing benefit issues. It's 26% increase in the last year. Uh, council tax arrears is a 6% increase and 28% increase in local authority rent arrears issues. So these are issues that we're having to deal with on behalf of clients, but it's local authority led issues as well. Um, and the main funders of uh, Citizens Advice Bureau are local authorities. Um, so we're having to deal with their cuts um, uh, and I'm making sure that we, we continue to work in partnership to, to work with their uh, constituents and our, and our uh, clients. Um, and what's actually really benefit us is the two and a half million the Scottish Government has, has given us, and that's allowed us to see uh, an extra 7,000 clients in the first six months of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's more than nearly 20,000 issues that we wouldn't have seen um, if uh, we had the same funding. So that's had a, a big impact. And in terms of the cooperation between yourselves and local authorities, um, about um, funding, uh, do you find that there is be, uh, there is a, a, a fair degree of cooperation, or is there some local authorities that are, are more uh, listening in terms of your needs than others? Um, the, there are citizens of Iceberg in the thirty of the thirty two local authorities, and there are eighty one members, so they all have their own individual agreements with, or most of them have individual agreements with the. The local authority. Um, so it very much depends on which local authority. Um, but we have been, it is noticeable that local, local authorities have put in place um, proactive measures to make sure that people aren't evicted, that renters are dealt with, they're going out to make sure people get DHPs. Um, so I think the, the approach of local authorities so far uh, in working in partnership and making sure they're uh, helping their tenants has, has been a big help so far. Very briefly, Cameron, Sorry, just on this issue. Is Citizens Advice the first port of, port of call you find for people who are in trouble? Uh, for many people it is, um, and they often come in crisis uh, where either they haven't managed to get help elsewhere or, or it is the first port of call. Uh, we do get a lot, lot of referrals from Job Centre Plus as well, which wow. is an issue in that they're not dealing with yeah. people that they should be dealing Thank with, you. and it gets passed on to Citizens Advice Group. Thank you. So much. Alec, please. I just wanted to pick up very briefly on the point about credit unions. I mean, one of the impacts that, that I've seen from a number of authorities is they're trying to develop an alternative to the loan sharks, the payday lenders, and it's whether the capacity is actually there within credit unions, um, and indeed whether credit unions are structured in such a way to be able to deal with that. I mean, my own credit union, I think it's 1% interest it takes. Um, certainly in discussions I've had with a number of companies like, like in Manchester as an example where the local authority there are involved with a company that, that's providing advice etc as well as loans but they're, they're, they're charging 40 percent and their argument is you can't go below that in terms of the levels of risk so I think local authorities Renfrew, Sandra Black, I know, I know Renfrew's done a fair bit of work, Glasgow has, has their own company I think that, that, that they've got set up Local authorities are trying to, to, to direct money, in my own case, five substantial amounts of money to try and develop credit unions. But the advice that we were getting was actually credit unions don't have the capacity or the or structure properly to be able to meet that demand or, or meet the challenge, if you like. I think that's an interesting point. And I think it's before structure and capacity, it's almost about inclination and cause and effect. So what we're looking to ta excuse me, tackle is an issue of a cheaper alternative to payday lending, when in actual fact credit unions are looking at what is causing the need for payday lending. So providing a cheaper alternative doesn't necessarily address the fundamental issue that there's insufficient disposable income to get through a calendar month. And even providing that service at a cheaper rate continues to reduce available disposable income of a member. Um, just to pick up, I guess, on the, the impact that it's having on, on Oxfam's programme, 
Two years ago, Oxfam didn't work with food banks. Uh, we, we do not want to be in a position where we're working with food banks. We now work with Western Barnshire Community Food Share, which operates three outlets um, providing food provision in, in Western Barnshire. And at a UK level, we work with the Trussell Trust. Um, the figures that we are seeing from, from them suggest in the past year we've had a five-fold increase uh, in food banks. So it's gone from 14,000 uh, um, people requiring food banks in 2012-13 to 71,000 in 2013-14. Um, in Western Bartonshire, we saw um, over 3,000 people using their, their, their food banks or their food provision uh, in, the, in the past year. Um, and I think the causes of that um, from both Western Bartonshire and Trussell Trust are, are quite well known and they, they reinforce one another that that's from, that's from benefit delay, that's from benefit changes that takes up about, about half of the reasons for using food banks. It's also from, from low income. Some of that's from benefits as uh, the 1% the uprating uh, kicks in and, and the cost of living increases. But it's also we're seeing people who are in work uh, having to go to food banks. So that's, that's obviously the impact of the economic recession and, and, and low wages. And I think, I think you're absolutely right to say that's, that's cost shunning from, from UK government. That's, from our perspective, that's us having to pick up the pieces of, of UK government's welfare reforms, which um, we, we do, do not really want to be in a position that we're doing, but, but we're having to do that because, because people, people need fed. How much cooperation um, is there between yourselves and the local authorities to deal with the fallout from this situation? O Oxfam, don't, we don't do frontline service delivery. So, um, so I think really the, the food bank providers are in a, a better position to, to talk about that. I, I know there is good cooperation uh, with Western Bartonshire Community Food Share and, and they do get some, I think, funding from local authorities. So there is... Uh, there is a, a, a collaboration in that area. Hey, please. Yeah, um, I'd just like to, to highlight the fact that although it, there's a very understandable um, focus on food banks, and we heard that in the earlier um, evidence given from the local authorities, I think it is quite important to, to see the impact in terms of actually the, the, the much longer established community responses to food poverty, uh, many of whom are... are been set up longer than the Scottish Parliament has. So food cooperatives, networks of these, um, Edinburgh itself is a network of 36 community cafes, um, weaning initiatives, lunch clubs, all, all, all these kind of initiatives are, are experiencing the, the impact as well. But not only that, but actually their experience and their relationship with local authorities, a long established relationship with local authorities in terms of buildings, personnel, funding, whatever, uh, is actually being put at use at the moment to uh, address um, the, the, the challenges, the emergency food aid. Uh, and I think it's important that we recognise both that there's an impact on some of these well established initiatives, but actually there's a lot of potential in building responses through them because not only do they have that relationship, as I say, with local authorities, but actually they work um, quite often closely with local credit unions, they work closely with local citizens' advice bureaus. So we have local infrastructures that have a lot of potential that are well established, but, e but are, are fragile in the current economic circumstances, as are a lot of people in the, in the voluntary sector. And do you think the cooperation between local government and some of the existing, long existing, long-standing organisations um, has been uh, good in terms of talking about resource or um, is it the case that sometimes local authorities um, are saying we are doing this and that's that? No, I, th I think the relationship is good. In fact, it's so good that a number of organisations are only too well aware of the difficult situation local authorities are in. So they are they are worried, but they're worried because they are well aware of the, the very serious challenges um, the local authority faces, and they do see them as, as a very key partner and are, are very concerned that there's any deterioration in that relationship at a time when actually the, the cooperation between the third sector and the local authority is more necessary than ever. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Dreiber. Um, it mentioned that uh, there were, say, the citizens' advice offices in uh, the 32 councils, um, but uh, but that's not factually accurate. Well, 30, 30 out of the 32, sorry. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in terms of the two uh, where there are no uh, uh, no uh, CABs, um, <clears throat> what uh, discussions or what activities uh, will you undertake? Uh, a with those local authorities. 
uh, try to assist, but also uh, be with other organisations in those areas um, who actually are uh, trying to deliver. Uh, the local authorities in question are Inverclyde and South Ayrshire mm -hmm. uh, that don't have the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, most Citizens Advice Bureau are community-led organisations, so we don't tend to set up CABs. We tend to they tend to be come from the community, and then they become CAB. Uh, it could be in those local authorities they have adequate advice provision. It hasn't occurred, but I, I know there there are discussions regularly with those councils about whether they can access CAB services and so on. So it's something we've thought about. Okay. Rosemary Broche, please. Uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments. I think one thing I'd, I'd like to draw attention to actually is, is that when we talk about welfare reform, we're actually talking about two almost separate spheres. One is the reform of the, the welfare system, how benefits are paid, how they're assessed. And we've heard about direct payments and we've heard about changes to personal independence payments. But on top of all that and alongside all of that, we're actually seeing major and really significant cuts to the entitlement that people are getting. And these two things together are certainly increasing demand on services like ours. People are, are worried and confused and, and anxious about the, the, the implications for them, but also struggling to, to cope with the debt and, and with the, um, the, the additional pressures it's putting on their budgets. But, but as a wider point here, and I think particularly um, in relation to your, your overall question for this roundtable, that certainly Shelter Scotland's concern is that, um, that what we're seeing with this, this, the range of cuts that we're getting is that it's actually affecting the underlying causes of homelessness in particular. It's, it's putting people more at risk and in, in a position where they're more liable to, to become homeless. But it's also, and I think as you heard from your previous witnesses, really affecting the capacity of local government and other agencies to respond to homelessness and their, their ability to, to deal with it when it happens. And, and this is a, a serious and significant concern, particularly in Scotland, because Scotland over the last decade has made very significant progress in, in tackling homelessness and has a very clear agenda and, and is, in fact, a world leader in, in handling um, and, and tackling homelessness. And we're beginning to see that there are big threats to, to Scotland's agenda in that respect. Um, we've, we've heard a little bit from, from Edinburgh about an increase in rough sleeping. This isn't something that we've been able to evidence across Scotland. There isn't a collection and account, but that certainly this kind of anecdotal evidence suggests that, that even at the very sharp end, we're seeing an increase in homelessness. One of the things it's difficult to, to really assess is how, how big a problem that's going to be because certainly from Shelter's experience, people will struggle on. You know, they'll continue trying to pay their rent, they'll access DHPs where they can until they reach the crisis point where they just can't continue and stay on top of their debt, at which point homelessness will occur. So I think actually, uh, i used this expression before, I think we see a lot of the problems uh, at the moment are still in the post, effectively. Thank you. John? Pick up on both points on the on, on the issue of food banks. Um, clearly, a crisis response to a crisis situation. Um, I think for us, the challenge for government at every level, including local government, is to um, how to find a, you know to, 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 to learn from the experience of food banks to understand why people are are in a situation where they're using emergency food provision and um, to understand in more detail what the causes of that are, and then use that in order to try and fix those bits of welfare social policy provision that are within their, their, their remit. Um, in terms of the... I suppose we come at it from a different angle because we're, we're not a food bank provider. We're, we are providing second-tier casework support and we're doing a whole lot of work at the moment to uh, understand and analyse um, what are the emerging issues as a result of welfare reform, changes in the benefit system. What's interesting there is that it's picking up on Francis' point is it's not necessarily kind of individual benefits or the big... The big, the big well-known changes. It's the kind of um, the way that benefits are being administered uh, and the kind of practical implementation of um, benefits policies. So it's issues around sanctions, increased use of sanctions. It's issues around benefit delays and just delays in, in benefits being paved. It's to do with changes in the way that benefit decisions can be reviewed. So no longer people able to go directly to tribunal to appeal, have to go back to the DWP or HMRC and ask for what's called a mandatory reconsideration, a whole lot of delays in that process, all of that leaving um, individual families, individuals with, um, with inadequate resources and adequate incomes. And when we're asking um, frontline advisors on what are the implications of that for the families that they're facing, very often one of the implications is those families have ended up having to, 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 to use food banks. Um, 
In terms of what the implications of that for local authorities, I think there, there's a few. There's one around uh, ensuring that um, delivery of the, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, and the, 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 is working as effectively as possible, um, because that's the other source of potential support for, 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 for families and individuals when, when they're facing those, those, those benefit problems, to make sure that that's the first port of call that people are getting what they're entitled to under um, the crisis grants and uh, community care grants. Um, I think there is an issue in terms of the ongoing benefit delays and the current guidance around Scottish Welfare Fund, which means that uh, you can only get, um, you know, th 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 I think it's three, three, three grants in a 12-month period or one in a, in a, in a 28-day period, where benefit delays are actually leading to people being in kind of repeat, repeat crisis, um, which potentially we could open up Scottish Welfare Fund to, to respond to that a bit more. But obviously, that has, that has implications. The other big implication is around advice provision. I think um, we've seen as a second tier provider a huge increase in the demand for our second tier support, our advice line support, our training, our information resources. Uh, there has been real investment in advice and information, income maximisation, welfare rights, money advice. And we've been it, getting it, a lot of queries from local authorities themselves, John, as well. Yes, now I, should have, I don't actually have a breakdown with me of what so we can support local authority as well as um, independents as advice bureaus, local welfare rights services. Uh, other services. Um, what, what is coming through is that in over half of the cases that we're looking at where there's been the need for casework support from us is that it's actually to do with um, misinformation or maladministration. Now, a big chunk of that is to do with DWP processing of benefits, but actually in, in, in many cases it's to do with maybe wrong information being provided um, by um, local advisors, local authority workers. So, so we had an example of a, you know, a mum of two who was given wrong, wrong advice by a local authority social worker, ended up being overpaid over £3,000 tax credits, a whole lot of financial crisis that flowed on from, from that. Um, another example relating to housing benefits, so this was um, local authority parents of a severely disabled child um, and the local authority failed to apply disability premiums to their housing benefit, which cost them £50 per week. So there, there, there's a lot, I mean, I welcome the investment that's gone into improving advice and information um, and supporting non-specialist advisors within local authorities and within their partner organisations to develop their awareness and their knowledge of the implications of welfare reform for the people they're working with. But I think those kind of cases and examples just highlight how important that is and how much more there is potentially to be done to ensure that frontline local authority workers have at least the, um, will have the basic knowledge of what implications of benefit changes might be for the families they're working with, but also are able to signpost to the specialist advice and information services and continue to fund and support those specialist services to be able to deal with those, those kind of cases so that we're not um, reinforcing the damage that's been done by <coughs> changes in the UK benefit system. Thanks. Mark. We heard earlier from local authorities that they're having some difficulty in reaching some members uh, of, of their community who are um, what you would define as the hard to reach, obviously, uh, bracket, and and making them aware of their eligibility, for example, for DHP, things like that. Many of your organisations will probably have regular contact with these individuals, certainly more regular contact than perhaps the local authority has. Have local authorities made any attempt to engage yourselves in uh, work to try and uh, reach out to these communities and these individuals, um, given that in many uh, instances they maybe view uh, your organisations as perhaps being uh, people they can be more open with than perhaps the local authority? Who wants to have a crack at that first? First. Just briefly, say, yes, my, my experience is local authorities have recognised that, um, that the voluntary sector is much closer to those that, as you say, um, could be called hard to reach or sometimes referred to them as rarely listened to, I think it's maybe more appropriate. <laughs> um, I, and I think I'd, I'd go further than that, working in the area of food, that they also appreciate that food's often an incredibly useful medium for, for reaching groups because it... Um, it, it does have so many different dimensions and qualities to it, so I, I think there is very good experience around the country in that, that way of working. Is it, is it widespread, or are there lo some local authorities are better than others, and if so, what's being done to maybe I try and some, encourage? I think some local authorities are always better than others, <laughs> just as some parts of the voluntary sector are, are better than others. Uh, and, and certainly ourselves and, and agencies like us are, are, are there to try and... Um, 
improved practice, shared practice. I think the voluntary sector certainly is, is at the forefront of, uh, that in terms of enthusiasm for sharing learning and developing practice. Uh, I, I think we, we again though have to recognise that that enthusiasm has to be maintained in, in a period when the, when the actual budgets and the pressure on budgets is getting greater and greater. Rosemary? <coughs> supporting people suggests that actually it, it's rarely one issue that, that they're dealing with. It's obviously often a very complex array of, of issues and, and often a, a benefit or a disruption to their, their benefits or, or their eligibility can have a really severe impact across a whole range of areas. So often it's finding, a, finding who the right agency is and who, who it is that's already working with that family or that, that individual and, and, and building up their... Um, their sort of confidence to, to work with them and I think as John was saying provision of the second tier advice is really important in, in those circumstances so certainly we, we are in a position where we're providing second tier advice to, to people who are already working with families and, and advocates in other areas but perhaps don't have the, yeah, the housing expertise that we have and the money debt advice expertise that we have. Keith? Uh, well, Citizens Advice Bureau are right on the, the front line. They do play their role as an intermediary uh, between local authorities and um, people that are needing support. Uh, I think last year we we dealt with nearly 4,000 new issues in DHPs, and most of them will be making sure that people are, are applying for DHPs and helping to fill out the form. And is there important that people who need support are connected with the local authority? I think it's not just with DHPs, it's with, as I mentioned, the Scottish Welfare Fund, is that... Um, there's there, or there was low awareness of that as a means of support, and it's, it's increasing, but there's still underspending there, uh, and it's really important that uh, local authorities uh, are able to to reach these people for DHPs and the Scottish Welfare Fund. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alec wants to pick up on a point, and I'll come back to you. Uh, Mike. Yeah. That Sue Bruce made in terms of Edinburgh, where she was saying that they really now are accepting that somebody phoning in and saying that they want to apply for DHP um, in terms of bedroom tax would be would be fine, would be set acceptable. So uh, are you seeing a mix across Scotland in terms of the way local authorities are, are dealing with this? Because certainly the view of the Parliament is that the monies are being made available and should be mitigating all the impact of bedroom tax. Mm -hmm. We tried to monitor the spend across <coughs> local authorities using Scottish Government money and then mapping that against the Citizens Advice Bureau experience, whether they're seeing people being knocked back. Uh, and there, there have been occasions when people have been knocked back when we know there's money there and being told there's not enough. But on the whole, they, those seem to be dying away. And I think our experience is, is, that, is that the money is being get, getting out there. But as we, we heard from local authorities, they're, they're still struggling to find or speak to some people who are just not responding. So it's very important that intermediaries like ourselves uh, play a role in making sure those people do get connected to local authorities. Rosemary, you want to come in on that point? Yeah, in a difficult position. They've had a, a, an initial budget and they set policies to administer that budget and it was massively increased midway through the year and they've had to go back and I think local authorities are perhaps revisiting some of the earlier claims and seeing whether they can now be paid out. There's also a problem about, obviously, about whether or not um, you know, how, how the application process works and whether or not they're having to do eligibility tests. So that there's, I think one of the things that we've certainly identified from looking at policies is that the local authorities should really be learning from one another and trying to pick up areas of good practice and, and how, in how they can ad administer DHPs. But, I mean, I think there's a wider point about DHPs, and, you know, you're, you're right in a way that, that the money is there and it should be available to, to really cancel out the effects of the bedroom tax. But I think, as again, as you heard from earlier witnesses, it's not just there for, for bedroom tax. It's there for people in the private rented sector and people who are being hit by a benefit cap, and it should be, be available to, to help with anybody who's struggling to pay their rent. But the other problem is that it, it's not a long-term fix. You know, this is something which can plug a gap for the next few years, but actually local authorities and, and other landlords are needing to look longer-term about people who's, who are struggling to pay their rent um, because of the cuts how they can perhaps find more appropriate accommodation for them or, or access to, to other kinds of benefit or support. Mark? Yeah, I, I wonder also as well around signposting and also, um, I mean, if I think of Woodside Community Centre in my constituency where there is the St Racker Credit Union uh, and the local housing office both based in the same facility and obviously that allows for uh, a degree of joint working to take place. Um, ha have you seen 
other examples and other authorities where there's an attempt to maybe try and bring some of these sorts of services together with local authority, be it the credit union, the CAB or, or other elements of the voluntary sector, so that people who are uh, at, at, at the sharp end of, of welfare reform have a kind of almost a one-stop shop kind of service or at least a a well a well linked service because obviously if they're being passed from pillar to post it can be very demoralising and also quite expensive for them as well. Also food share there as well as they're not through C. Yeah, but indeed. Who wants to pick up on that point? Dermot? Yeah. Please. Yeah, St Marcus is actually one of our credit unions. It's, it's a good you should probably declare an interest as a member of St Marcus Credit Union <laughs> since it's been mentioned now actually. Um, Sorry. I think it's a good example where that joined up approach or partnership working can have real benefit to the people who need it most. I think that the problem for credit unions is that they're often identified, wrongly identified as being a solution to the wrong to a, to a problem that they're not actually. Credit unions can only help when a capacity to save and or repay a credit commitment exists. And often, increasingly often, the the individuals presented to credit unions lack both capacities and therefore credit unions by default have no capacity to help that person. So a credit unions can be part of the solution but only when the capacity for the member to, to either save and or repay borrowing already exists. Credit unions can generate additional income which is often what's needed um, by the member rather than a capacity to save. Help in the long term, maybe not in the short term crisis scenario, but in the long term. Um, that yeah, advice. absolutely. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that the, the it's the expectation of external stakeholders is that credit credit unions are often identified as the solution. The person signposted to deliver to, and then feels disappointed that the credit union hasn't been able to offer the immediate solution to the crisis that they're currently facing. In terms of. Uh, of uh, joint sharing of offices and various other things. Is that useful in terms of the work that you do? Is that helping get folk out of their difficulties? John? I'm not sure in terms of joint sharing of office, offices, but certainly kind of working in partnership and integrating, um, from our point of view, particular interest in income maximisation services, welfare rights, money advice um, services. You know, a good example where Glasgow City Council working in partnership with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, to integrate uh, an income maximisation service into their, um, their, 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 their health service so that at that point where people are having a child um, and then run up to that, they're then being um, referred to uh, income maximisation advice uh, and that's ensuring that those families are getting the financial support they're entitled to at that point where they're suddenly incurring a whole lot of additional costs uh, and under financial pressures and too often not getting the financial support they, they, they were entitled to. Um, so I think the first phase of that project, the, the Healthier Wealthier Children project, um, two and a half thousand households were referred for advice, um, primarily from antenatal and community child health um, health services to um, welfare rights, uh, income maximisation um, workers, uh, and that added two, over two million pounds to the incomes of those two and a half thousand households. So it's a kind of example there, a way of working that's within the health service, but I think there's maybe ways of working there we can think about within other statutory mainstream services. Where is it actually most families have a contact with, and clearly uh, health service at the point of having a child, but there's other education, there's other points at which could we actually start thinking about how do we build in um, income maximisation, um, money advice services to ensure that families are actually getting what they're entitled to um, as the system goes through such huge changes. Cheers. Anne? Sorry, please get on. Um, John, um, John, you had mentioned earlier, one of my questions was about, well, we don't have um, huge pots of money, but given that you do do a direct service to the people in our communities, without, without extra funding, what could the local government be doing better to help work with yourselves? And I know that um, Rosemary had gave an example there about local authorities should be learning best practice from one another. Um, that really shouldn't be taking up any extra funding, in a sense, um, for that to happen. But what, what uh, the other projects that are here today, without spending any money, how would that relationship be bettered? 
Keith, if you want to go first. Yeah, sure, my, my answer to Mark McDonald's and, and your own question is, is pretty much the same. It's, um, it's to say the importance of partnership working and, and, and good signposting, because we, we find that the more somebody's signposted, the less likely they are to then go into the, the right place. So it's, it's about making sure people get to the right place. Uh, and having a preventative approach, <coughs> um, I'm aware of one local authority where if somebody has a notice of eviction, then they're always sent to the Citizens Advice Bureau and their their details are always given to the Citizens Advice Bureau. Uh, so it's not left to them to sort it out and then suddenly on the day they come to Citizens Advice Bureau. It's to make sure that that preventative approach is there. And, and, and any approach where it's about prevention uh, and making sure somebody gets advice at the right moment, either when they're in crisis, is to be welcomed. And I don't think that takes a lot of money. It's just about having good and efficient systems of signposting and referral, I think. Thank you. Rosemary, please. Yeah, absolutely pick up on the point about prevention. I think that, that is really, really is the key, and it's not a new thing. You know, this is something that local government has been learning from, and particularly in the area I'm interested in, housing and homelessness, it has been, you know, that's the big story. We need to be focusing on prevention because it's no good somebody being evicted for rent arrears. Uh, you just come back to the council and apply as homeless, and it actually costs local authorities significant, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds to, to deal with somebody in that way. And a long-standing um, policy of, of shelters has been working with councils to say, and, and other landlords to say, evicting people for rent arrears is counterproductive. You don't help that person. You don't help them manage their money and their debt better. So getting in there early, um, giving them debt advice, and, and actually working with them to repay those arrears while staying in the tenancy is, is the best, best practice and the best approach. Um, so, you know, I think, I think certainly prevention is very important, but actually learning or, as well from lessons that, that we're seeing elsewhere. So we've heard from Inverness today, you've heard from Inverness, and they're now implementing universal credit, albeit on a very, very sort of limited basis, and it's only the simplest cases that are being seen. But there's lessons coming out of that. Um, and we know that, for example, direct payments, which are a feature of universal credit, where the, the tenant will be paid directly their benefits rather than going to, straight to the landlord, um, that's been trialled in Edinburgh, and there's some extremely useful information come out of that trial um, with Dunedin Canmore. And I'd recommend to the committee to, to potentially have a look at that, because I think one of the things that they've identified through that trial is the enormous resources that it's taken to get tenants to pay the rent. And it's not easy to identify who it is who's more likely to pay. Um, because often, you know, you can, you, can, you can get to know your tenants, you understand them, and you may be able to identify people you think will have trouble paying. It's not always those people, but certainly that housing association's found that it's taken up vast amounts of their time and resources to, to work with tenants to get them to pay rent. Now, that, that's all stuff that, that we know now from that trial, and I think it's, it's how we share that information across Scotland so that local authorities and landlords across Scotland can be prepared when direct payments come in. To, and, and geared up, if you like, so that we don't get to a crisis point. Because yeah. I think the Welfare Reform Committee has already got it. Francis, please. Just on the point about joint working and a, an example from the voluntary sector, I guess, I mentioned earlier Western Bartonshire Community Food Chair, and they were very much born out of Clyde Bank Independent Resource Centre, which is a welfare rights and income maximisation uh, centre in, in Clyde Bank. Um, and there's a lot of sort of joint uh, or cross referrals between those those services so that's that's a good example of those referrals there's also examples um and from from london i think in, in tower hamlets where there's there's welfare rights advisors in trussell trust food banks um and and i think some of the evaluation of that has been positive i think we'd we'd be careful about institutionalizing um, that within sort of having a one-stop shop, which is a food bank. You know, there's already obviously great work being done by Citizens Advice and others. So it's, it's a case of linking those, those partners up rather than just creating new one-stop shops. Just to, to back up and reinforce this, that the, our enthusiasm for preventative spend, because I think I, I noted that at least one of the local authorities clearly stressed that and I, and I just think there's a potential danger that whilst we do want to collaborate in terms of managing the crisis situation that we find ourselves in that that does nothing to dent that enthusiasm for for a, for a more preventative approach and, and just as one small example certainly I was talking to someone who manages a, a whole range of community initiatives in, in North Lanarkshire just yesterday and he was saying three of their food cooperatives deliberately meet in the same building at the same time as the local credit union so I think there's a lot of informal I echo the point about not necessarily a formal one-stop shop but there's a lot of informal um, 
attempts to, to join up resources in a very positive way and in a very preventative manner. Sir? One of the issues that I'm picking up is that all the good work that's been done by the people around the ta organisations around the table and others out with here, and I think Francis mentioned the Clyde Bank Independent Advice Centre. It was mentioned earlier by Keith that there was a two and a half million pound grant from the Scottish Government to see Citizens Advice Scotland to be in recognition of the advice services that were being delivered by the CABs throughout Scotland. One of the one of the things that's come out of the review of the budgets of local <coughs> government uh, is the cuts that sometimes apply unfairly in some respects to the voluntary sector and particularly to the advice sector. And I would like to seek the opinions of views of the individuals around the table as to whether or not all the work that you're doing in terms of providing direct frontline services, advice services, and second tier advice services, is there any indications at the present moment that local authorities are looking to cut back or reduce the amount of funding? Uh, that your organisation receives. I know Dermot made reference to some of the work that's done with the credit unions and the support they receive from local authorities. But what would be the impact if you would if you received a cut in relation to the support, financial support from local authorities? Dermot, do you want to go first? Yeah, very quickly. Our group of credit unions, um, the vast majority of them, of them are not in receipt of direct um, local authority funding uh, and um, uh, and therefore should the general local authority position change it may not have as direct an impact on our group of credit unions as it may have on others but I think just to, to supplement that credit unions are, are being asked to be are being encouraged to be something different and they can be something different and assist local authorities more in some of the immediate problems they have. But in order for credit unions to do that, the movement as a, as a collective needs to upskill, and that's partly to do with capacity, partly to do with the uh, um, resource, but entirely to do with the people involved in credit unions, the leaders of credit unions, the volunteers, and that's the type of... Um, advancement that our sector would need to undergo to be a bigger impact um, or provide a bigger impact on, on some of these social challenges. Uh, the majority of uh, your funding comes directly from uh, local authorities, so any cut would have automatically have a big impact on us. Um, our Bureau of Funding has broadly been protected uh, as of yet. It, it certainly isn't going up, but it, it's maintaining Bureau at at the level I need to be at the moment. Um, to, to give an example of what would happen, you just have to look in England, who've had a much worse um, experience where cuts have uh, impacts on citizens' advice were much more, I believe, than Birmingham. They don't have a CEB anymore um, because of the local authority cuts. I think they lost over a million pounds in funding. Um, so that's a sort of salutary example. Uh, in Scotland, um, CEBs are, are increasingly project funded, so they're, they're, going, they're being funded for projects other than their core work increasingly. Um, many local authorities are, are moving towards tendering processes other than automatic giving a grant to, to CABs. Uh, and a lot of them are encouraging partnerships, so getting partners to, to bid as a group rather than individually. Um, so while the, the month funding is holding steady, there's a, there's a change in, uh, in, the t in, in that there's more tendering, more projects and, and more partnerships being encouraged. Rosemary, you wanted yeah, to come in there? To say that you know, part of a trend that's, that we've experienced over the last little while, shelters certainly preparing for reduced uh, uh, funding from, from local government for, for our services. We're, we're looking at alternative means and particularly maximising voluntary income fundraising effectively um, and looking, at, looking elsewhere, looking particularly at, um, at foundations and, and trusts to, to support us in the work that we do in the future. Thank you. Alec? Alec. Yeah. Could I, I mean, maybe shift it a little bit? I, over this last few weeks, I've, I've um, had constituents come to me where they've been sanctioned, and some of the sanctions just seem to be quite ridiculous, and that process of appealing that you talked about earlier. But it strikes me, what kind of work's going on to support individuals um, 
given that these sanctions seem to be something that's almost like being encouraged um, through the DWP. Sanctioning and, and its effects. Keith, you've sure. given evidence just recently to welfare reform and, and this issues. Yeah, I'd say sanctions are probably our number one um, sort of campaigning issue at the moment because they're probably the number one most damaging issue for our clients. Um, I think I was just looking at statistics yesterday and it was something like 80,000 JSA sanctions were applied in Scotland last year and it's 228 per day. Um, we've seen the impact on Bureau in terms of a 25% increase in JSA issues coming, even though there are less people in JSA in Scotland. Uh, and as you mentioned, the, the reasons for sanctions often seem uh, really counterproductive. People applying for two few jobs, 19 instead of 20 uh, a week, not evidence in job searching, um, not filling in your diary properly, uh, failing to attend job centre plus interviews, for example, when you've got an actual interview with an employer but you didn't turn up to job centre plus, people still getting sanctioned. And people that aren't able to go online, they're, they're trying. We heard about library appointments, people that just aren't able to, to do it. They're, they're trying but they're getting sanctioned for not being, being able to do it. And just quickly, in terms of a re response, uh, next month, uh, we're having a sort of sanctions month for training up all bureau to make sure they're aware of this all the sanctions process and what you can do to help your clients in terms of appealing mandatory reconsideration. Uh, also understand there's 20 fee bureau pre preparing uh, something called um, survival guides uh, for local citizens. So it's it's mapping out everywhere people can go locally to survive without if they've got a sanction basically you know uh, for food food foods furniture um, emergencies and anywhere in the local authority uh, so that's the that's the level that it's gotten to it's probably the number one cause of uh, of food parcel referrals and we're having to produce survival guides um, to make sure that people can survive um, on their sanctions Francis just to pick up on that, like Oxfam work with a couple of our partners do work specifically on welfare reform, but most, most of them don't. Um, and But you only need to go sort of have a tour of our different partners to, to see that sanctions is one of the top issues coming through them all. Even working with, with volunteers, um, many of them have been sanctioned. The DWP released uh, statistics, which I think uh, Keith was probably referring to um, a couple of weeks ago. I was looking at that the other day and... That showed that since the claimant commitment was brought in uh, in late October 2012 and the end of 2013, there was 97,000 uh, sanctions applied in Scotland. That was impacting on about 60,000 individuals. Um, that obviously doesn't <coughs> take account of employment support allowance sanctions, which I think were about 3,000. So you're looking at um, 100,000 sanctions in Scotland in about 14 months. Um, that obviously raises huge questions about um, the role of, of the state in, in possibly forcing people into destitution and, and also their, their role in living up to their commitments under, for example, the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights about uh, a right to an adequate standard of living and access to food uh, and the right to security uh, when unemployed. Um, it also raises massive questions about who, who has been impacted. And if you look at the UK data, uh, on job seekers allowance sanctions, that suggests one in five are have a disability. Uh, the, the the massive majority are, are young men, so I think 71% are men, and about 56% of people are are under 30. Um, it also raises huge issues about um, the fairness of those sanctions. Um, and from the analysis that we've done, it looks at that about 48% of people. Uh, who've sort of questioned the job seekers allowance sanction or, or asked uh, or gone to appeal uh, that's overturned so you've got about half of of those sanctions being uh, applied wrongly um in terms of the response like that date on sanctions is available at, for for every job center so you can you can look at in Aberdeen, uh, over three thousand people in, in, a, in a specific job center have been been sanctioned so there you'd think that you should be able to get data from the DWP on people that have been sanctioned by area. Uh, that that sounded like it was difficult for local authorities to access that data, but that, that should be something that you should be able to do better. For them to access, and then they have the greater destitution cases coming to them for, for support. Um, Rosemary, first, please. Yeah, just to add to what everybody has already said, that the knock-on implications, and again, I'm speaking here from a housing perspective, that often 
Um, the ramifications for housing benefit often it, housing benefit is often stopped or interrupted when somebody's sanctioned. But there's no necessary reason why that has to happen, and I think people wrongly assume housing benefit mm -hmm. is stopped at the same time as JSA, and that's just not the case. But part of handling the claim um, income needs to be verified, and it often is stopped, and that on top of the, the crisis that person's going through when their, their, their only source of income for food, etc., is stopped and they're having to handle that, they then need to go and, and restart their housing benefit. Um, it can automatically lead to rent arrears. And one thing I'd like to mention, actually, because you heard rent arrears figures here, that often arrears can build up, not because somebody's in, in, unable to pay, but just that, the, as we've talked already about, processing delays with benefits mean that before you even get paid, you can be a month or two in arrears. Now, that has problems, obviously, that individual's carrying that debt and needs to, needs to pay it back, but it also then has problems for, for local authorities and, and, their, and, and sorry, other landlords in their, their, their rent um, collection processes. So, you know, that, that what we're creating here and that the way the benefits are processed, as well as the, the cuts on top of the cuts, leads to problems for individuals, and a particular time when they're most vulnerable. Some of the local authorities used to have immensely good figures in terms mm. of getting housing benefit cases dealt with very, very yeah. quickly. Are we seeing any changes in that front? And does that have an effect on folks who are presenting themselves to you? I think certainly it's it's one of one of the factors that we'd want local authorities to be looking very carefully at. But a word of caution perhaps for the future is when we do see, and again, we've looked at like, universal credit being in, introduced um, universal credit will be handled centrally, as I'm sure you know, from, from Warrington. Local authorities will no longer have that information. And I think particularly if your landlord is an RSL, that RSL isn't going to have that connection with the, the local authority benefit officer to, to say what's going on with the claim. They're going to have to go through the applicant themselves. And I think, again, we're anticipating problems there. That lack of knowledge in yeah. itself may cause and, and future the, the, difficulties. Yeah, the joined upness of it. John and then Dermot, please. You know, just to reinforce the point that's been made already, I think just how important it is that agencies, local authorities, the partners who are working with people who have been sanctioned, that the first point was to check whether they've been sanctioned correctly, because so, so, so much of the sanctioning, and from our case, evidence is, is, is actually just wrongly applied. People have been mm -hmm. sanctioned. So it, it, important to, to, to appeal those decisions. Important, too, because obviously sanctions get worse and worse second or third time you're sanctioned, actually, it becomes more and more. So you might think you can put up with it after the first time, um, but a real risk then if you're then sanctioned again. And the other thing, I suppose, is just there's more and more discretion being built into the social security system, which creates more um, you know, more difficulty in terms of how, 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 how sanctions and how benefits are administered uh, locally, but potentially creates opportunities, I think, at local level to work with um, DWT, Job Centre Plus staff, to try and influence the culture and to raise the issues where there's actually been decision making that's wrong, where, where people are, where, where, where sanctions are either being applied either wrongly or where discussion has been used in such a way as it actually could have been used another way to avoid um, people being, being sanctioned. Dermot and then Cameron, please. The, the impact of, of sanctions has a significant presents a significant dilemma for for credit unions, in that when a person finds themselves without money, they often make a request to the credit union to access credit. And the dilemma for credit unions is how can a credit union responsibly lend to a person who can't demonstrate the capacity to repay that credit? If that loan is made in good faith and, and unfortunately was to go bad, it further inhibits the future capacity for credit unions to help more people, and so the cycle continues. So it's a significant dilemma that credit unions really struggle with. Thank you very much indeed. Could I move it on? I just wanted to, you all mentioned one-stop shops, and how do people contact you? Do they come in uh, Physically, or do they contact you online? And do you treat them any differently if they've come in, if they've come in online? For instance, go to the library. Are they treated any differently? Who wants to deal with that um, in terms of the advice you give? Rosemary? We are expanding the, the options for people who come to us for advice. We've, we run a national, free national helpline. Um, that we also have hubs, uh, advice and support hubs within each of the major cities in Scotland. But we recognise that not everybody can... can can reach us on, on those uh, in those ways, um, particularly if in rural areas of Scotland. So we, we also have really um, excellent information online, so people can access online information. And we're also now beginning to to roll out a program of, of uh, kind of tech support, so you can, while you're online, have a have an online live chat with with an advisor as well. 
Excuse me. Do you find many people contact you online, or more and more? Is this happening? We we are getting certainly. We can track the number of people who are reading our mm. advice pages, and we are getting mm. significant increases in, mm. in in traffic on on those pages that relate to mm. debt advice and to, to welfare change advice. Well, for your web advice, yeah. I use it in my office a lot. What about? Um, I was just going to say, what about the others? Does anybody are they treated any differently if people come online rather than actually physically going into a, an office or in a terms of the place? citizens advice bureau? Yes. Please? Uh, a very similar answer to Rosemary, actually. Uh, we have a national advice line that's accessible to anybody uh, in Scotland. Uh, and as well, uh, our advice guide is, is increasingly used for self-help. Uh, I suppose at a local level, it's really important that all local services and local authority are connected in some way, so that if you go to one place, it doesn't that you get connected on if that's the right place for you to go. So it's really important that it's a one-stop shop in the sense that people can organisations can recognise where the right place is for you to go if it's not then, so to make sure that the person does get to the right place. Mm. We don't waste time on it, yeah. yeah. Francis, please. I think I mentioned earlier that Oxfam itself don't do frontline del delivery in Scotland, but we work with community groups, so we work with about 10 community groups across Scotland, and, and that's, that's where they're based, they're based in the community, so the vast majority of people that use them are, are coming through their doors, and, and they're in the most deprived communities in Scotland, so I think I don't have statistics at hand, but I'd be very surprised if, if many people contacted them online. I recognise we're getting pushed for time now, but Stuart, briefly. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, you know, going forward, what do you see the, uh, the major challenges uh, are going to be to each of your organisations, but also uh, to the, the effects upon the local authority spend? I'll add to that question somewhat, and you can maybe answer both at once. Um, and that is that you'll be aware that UK ministers have refused to come to this parliament to give evidence on this issue, that Esther McVeigh is here soon. What would you say to Esther McVeigh? What would you ask her if you had the opportunity? So if you could answer both. Francis, can I start with you, please? Yep. Uh, in terms of um, questions to Esther McVeigh, like uh, Oxfam approach um, and a, a global sense is about uh, people's human rights and I think a, a question perhaps to put to her is to what extent are many of the UK government's welfare reforms compatible with uh, its commitments to, to those those human rights um, sorry what was the, the first in question? In terms of the local authority aspect of it the challenges. Um, the challenges. I, guess, I guess the challenge for, for our programme is that, and I think this has been alluded to by, by many already is about the, the trends are, are not good and um, traditionally Oxfam's programme has always been trying to be more preventative, trying to be, be upstream, uh, not just doing crisis interventions. Um, but if, if people need help, people need help. So trying to balance those two, two challenges is probably a challenge for our programme. Thank you. Dermot, please. In terms of the question, we probably make more of a statement, which is that the credit union sector um, cannot be a distribution channel for uh, a Westminster government. The, the essence of credit unions is independent, independent autonomous organisations reflective of their own local community needs rather than a, 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 nation, a, a, a national distribution channel for uh, welfare benefits. In terms of our major challenges as a sector going forward, it, it's about how do we adapt to, to, to the new challenges? How do we move from or, or even should we move from a save and borrow philosophy to a deposit and withdraw function? Uh, and that's a, an internal dilemma for the credit unions to resolve themselves. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've got a few. Um, on the, the bedroom tax, uh, I think it's we've heard about the, um, the sort of administrative burden that puts on local authorities in terms of DHP going out and identifying and, and communicating with people. We'd much prefer there to be proper exemptions in place so that the, the most vulnerable aren't affected at all, rather than actually DHPs relying on the short-term solution. There needs to be a long-term solution uh, for the most vulnerable. Uh, sanctions, I think there's major changes needed. Uh, I think for it to be a proper deterrent, there actually has to be a warning thirst, not just go straight to uh, sanction uh, and there's major administrative problems uh, in that. Um, we've mentioned personal independence um, briefly and I think that that could be a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, ESA is by far the biggest issue that people come to Bureau with um, and personal independence 
uh, payment, but daily is claimed by even more people. So the, it's I think hundred odd thousand. Sorry, I can check that stat. Uh, will will have to be reassessed. So that that's that's uh, a potential problem, especially considering the initial. Uh, experiences of it are so poor in terms of people waiting months and months for an assessment. So universal credit um, online applications and direct payments are, are, are a big um, potential problem for us. Uh, potential, uh, we fill out tens of thousands of forms on behalf of claimants each year, but if that's moving to online, what does that mean to Citizens Advice Bureau? Um, you know, we're urgently trying to, to come up with local solutions for that. Uh, and we're, we're concerned about the exemptions for direct payments and online applications that the process of that whether it's too slow whether it actually help people that need support uh, and finally um, just a general point about job center plus and dwp they need to provide more support to claimants we we see literally tens of thousands of claimants that probably should have been supporters um by the job center but they're referred on to to um, citizens of Vice Bureau, so I think there needs to be a change of culture in DWP to support people rather than trying to find them out for sanctioning. Thank you. Bill, please. Yeah. Um, in the, the, the government's national food and drink policy, the third sector is referred to as a, a, a remarkable legacy and current resource for, for Scotland, and, and I think that's very true. I, I think, however, it, it's such a remarkable resource that, that actually um, almost threatens itself with how much it has to contribute. Um, many of the community food initiatives we work with do take the, the line that Francis referred to in terms of seeing food as a human right. They're, they're very much concerned with promoting social justice, but equally they're engaged in tackling health inequalities, they're engaged in tackling uh, pursuing environmental justice as well, uh, and, and I could be just as likely appearing at a committee looking at the contribution of community food initiatives to, to the food needs of older people in the community, to, to issues around mental health, to issues around um, early years, and I think it's that richness that these initiatives um, offer is also the danger because a lot of the initiatives tell us they worry about falling between agencies, including funding agencies, falling between various responsibilities from local authority, health boards, other departments, falling between outcomes and, and, and as I say, most dangerously falling between budgets. So I think that, uh, we have a wonderful resource here and the real challenge is how do we, we maintain that and recognise it. Thank you. Mary, please. I suppose I'd, I'd remark that Scotland has got a, a really, you know, remarkable and unique uh, political consensus around tackling poverty, preventing homelessness, um, and that's been in evidence since the Parliament was created. And I, I think that what, as I, as I opened by saying that, I think we're beginning to see these external threats coming um, and and potentially challenging um, the ability to deliver on that consensus at a local level. Um, and I think that, that my main message would be let's let's remember what actually we want to set out to achieve here and that certainly around prevention of homelessness, that there's been no kind of uh, retreat from that as an objective and we need to really understand how we can continue to focus on prevention and, and understand the implications of some of potentially some of the, the crisis responses that we've heard to, to that overall agenda. Yeah, I mean, in terms of UK government, I suppose the, the key thing would be to review current approach to social security with a view to the commitments that this government continues to have and is under legislative duty uh, in relation to the child poverty act to, to look in terms of what's the impact on, on child poverty and the biggest single driver in terms of driving up child poverty the single biggest change in, 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 in benefits has been the break between the operating of benefits and tax credits and, and inflation which kind of sometimes gets overlooked so that's a, a key thing we'd want to to flag up and seek to change here in Scotland, I mean, I think the big challenge is one is about, I think, sustaining the investment in advice and information. I think we've all said there has been real investment in advice and information services. That has really helped. Uh, but clearly, there's still gaps. There's still people who are getting wrong advice, aren't getting advice when they could do, and as a result, uh, are suffering more than they need to as a result of, of, of sanctioning or other um, benefit changes or benefit delays. The other key one is to ensure that the Scottish Welfare Fund um, is delivered in such a way as it uh, genuinely is accessible and helps to meet um, crisis uh, and the excep exceptional pressures that uh, families uh, too often face, um, whether that's as a result of benefit changes or for, or for other reasons. 
And then the third area is something that we've not actually picked up on, so just take the opportunity, is, is, is the issue of public transport uh, and potential role for, for local government and government in Scotland. Uh, and I, you know, one of the, the key um, issues that's come through in the, the casework that we've been an analysing is how much uh, unaccessible or unaffordable public transport has been uh, a factor in either being sanctioned, being unable to get to job centre, being unable to get to interviews, um, and then in terms of then trying to claim hardship payments, having no money because you've been sanctioned. I mean, people have been advised they should walk 13 miles, having their interviews shifted to the middle of the day so they can get to the job centre and back again, walk 13 miles there, walk 13 miles back. I mean, there's a, an issue around tra transport here, I think, which we haven't, uh, in public transport, and potential things can we be looking at in Scotland to ease some of those pressures to ensure that people are able to, 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 to get themselves um, to job centres and to... I'll talk to you more about that one afterwards. Thank you very much for your time today. I know that many of you have given evidence to the Welfare Reform Committee previously. I, I think it was good for us to, to be able to look at the local government aspects of welfare reform and the impacts there and the, the obvious cost shunting that's going on. Thank you. I suspend we move into the private session.